Good evening, everybody. This is the regular meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education here on Monday, April the 12th, 2021, at 7 p.m. at the Downers Grove Village Hall. This meeting is being live streamed for the public on the Village of Downers Grove YouTube channel. Melissa, will you please call a roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member <clears throat> Olchek. Here. Member Samanti. Here. Member Weiner. Here. And Member Hughes. Here. Members of the public who are viewing remotely may provide a public comment by calling 630-743-4085 and recording their comment. Comments will be accepted up until the point where we reach public comment portion on the agenda. We will then play all comments remotely submitted in the order in which they were received. I have uh, allotted at least 30 minutes for public comment tonight. Anybody here in the room, if you are interested in making a public comment, please fill out a card and place it in the basket. We will be calling any comments here in person first. And we're asking you to keep your comments to three minutes. As always, we're gonna start off today with our flag salute and the Pledge of Allegiance. We're welcoming today Hillcrest School. So please welcome our principal and assistant principal, Michelle Zebka and Lori Smith. Thank you so much. And we actually worked together with our student council and PTA to put it all in one package for you. So Dr. Eichmiller's gonna get us going. requires all hands on deck. All agents report to Hound headquarters immediately. <laughs> Copy that. Copy, Copy that. that. Copy that. Agents up to Egypt. Let's go. up to speed with where things are at with student council. As a newly elected student council, our focus has been on continuing the mission possible mentality and raising spirits at Hillcrest and throughout the community. We sponsored Spirit Days for Read Across America Week and partnered with our teacher librarian to provide book recommendations for both our youngest students and our older grade levels. We also hosted March Madness Spirit Days and partnered with PTA to welcome our families to our virtual trivia night and a Zoom dance party. Coming up in the next month, we have a secret service project to collect items for the West Suburban Food Pantry. We are excited about this project and eager to motivate students and families to find ways to give back to our community. Agents Grams and Oros, can you update headquarters on what's going on in the field? Let's see what's going on in fourth grade. Looks like they're annotating text. That's right, Agent Grams. You've scoped this one out, right? Although instruction has taken on a different look with social distancing, using the Benchmark Language Arts Curriculum resource, teachers have embraced the challenge and found new ways to work collaboratively in a larger whole group setting, as well as partnering students up and working with smaller guided reading groups to support differentiated instruction. Oh, there's no secret here. First grade is up to something sneaky. You've Got it, Agent Oros. Here we see students are expanding their thinking and demonstrating several different strategies to make numbers.
Whether it's through number talks or hands-on activities from the New Bridges Math Curriculum resource, as we look to meet our key performance indicators, a top priority and focus continues to be on finding ways to help students of all abilities continue to make growth. Teachers incorporate opportunities for students to develop various problem-solving skills and demonstrate their understanding using multiple strategies. I see our allies are collaborating on the next mission. We're ready to take on the challenges ahead. As a school community, we have worked diligently throughout the year to adapt and change to meet the needs of our students with regard to the latest health and safety guidance. Thoughtful attention has been given to address and tend to students' social-emotional well-being while also taking into consideration our individual, grade level, and school-wide academic needs. In an effort to stay focused on the strategic plan, the staff continues to drill down data through the problem-solving process for individuals and through our regular benchmark data review process. We have reflected on our successes. In this case, we were pleased to see that we exceeded the spring growth targets with the winter 2021 median map percentiles. We also recognize areas for improvement as indicated here by our winter to winter grade level map quadrant charts. In this case, our overall student growth is an area of future focus. In all cases, the vision and mission of District 58 is at the forefront of our planning and initiatives. We remain student-centered with our efforts and believe that it is our role and duty to meet students where they're at and bring them to reach their full potential. Agent Smith, can you please fill us in on mission special programs? At Hillcrest, we have the privilege of hosting one of the three specialized programs for District 58, the Developmental Learning Program. While this is a highly individualized special education program designed to meet the intensive needs of students with known or suspected intellectual disabilities, through this program's inclusive structure, all of our students at Hillcrest learn from one another and have the opportunity to serve in the capacity of a peer model, as well as learn about acceptance and understanding that all students learn differently. This program does so much more than benefit our students with special needs. The goal is to make every student feel like they are an equal part of the Hillcrest School community. This prepares our students to relate to people of all abilities as one would outside of the walls of the school. The mentality is that we are all hound dogs with unique talents, strengths, and skills. Students participating in the developmental learning program gain social skills, communication skills, and content knowledge during their general education inclusion time. They also benefit from explicit life skills instruction and differentiated academics structured around the essential elements within the specialized program classrooms. During classroom-based weekly group therapies supported by our speech language pathologist and social worker, students are engaged in hands-on problem solving, as well as enriching language activities linked to community-based curriculum that promotes generalization of skills through repetition and exposure. Many of these lessons and activities serve as a precursor and targeted support for our students prior to culminating activities taking place during community-based instruction. This is special programs, up and out. PTA, this is headquarters. Update needed on mission Raising Spirits. Good evening, I'm Agent Healy. Special <laughs> code name, Agent Fun. Hi, I'm Agent Punman, AKA Agent Sunshine. This year, we introduced the Hillcrest Holiday Lane. We put up 10 trees that line the streets of Jefferson, and every student had the opportunity to decorate them, including fac faculty and staff. We also had a sharing connections giving tree. Many people from the community, as well as families, donated truckloads of items that we brought over to sharing connections. Students were given the opportunity to paint rocks for our new Hillcrest Kindness Rock Garden. We also had to offer trivia. Hillcrest Hound Dogs love trivia nights. Over 50 families participated in our virtual family trivia night in March. Many of the things that we did this year that we accomplished will continue on next year. We formulated a sunshine committee to help with lots of events throughout the year. We have Hound Dog of the Month signs that we put in front of each student's home. We also have PTA Zooms that will continue on into 2021 and 2022 based on great attendance by our families. 
this year. Mission accomplished. Thank you uh, for indulging us here for a short. <laughs> so there you have it. We like to have a little fun at Hillcrest. Um, and this really, um, I think, embodies the Hillcrest mentality, where we are one, working together collaboratively. Um, we are so fortunate to have such a wonderful, supportive um, family, uh, community, the students and staff, this video, <laughs> we wanted to be one message um, of how far we have come this year with that, you know, like, how are we going to do this to this is definitely something we can do and, and do well. Um, our creative director here, uh, Mrs. Lauren Prosser, is also our student council uh, sponsor. And then, of course, Mrs. Smith and our um, PTA co-presidents, Ann Healy and Connie Punman. So thank you to all of them. Thank you for allowing us this opportunity. Um, we are blessed and fortunate to just work in a wonderful community. And thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you guys so much. Wonderful presentation. We always appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. I didn't know our special effects budget was so large. I know. <laughs> I movie can do wonderful things on those Mac computers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like we're creating some kind of competition now between the schools though. They're going to start. I have a sneaking suspicion. Yes. Yeah. Michelle definitely just raised the bar with Lori. Thank you. <laughs> All right, moving on. We're going to hit our first non-action report of the night, and that is a spotlight on our school with a facilities update. Uh, I think you're going to kick it off, Dr. Russell, but we have. Mr. Drayfall as well. Yeah, Todd's gonna to be at the podium and I'll stay up here just for uh, social distancing uh, reasons. Tonight, I wanna thank everyone in the audience for joining us on our Spotlight on Facilities. Uh, the reason this Spotlight is this evening, believe it or not, this was scheduled all year to be on this evening and then after subsequent conversations with our uh, Financial Advisory Committee and at the February board meeting, we determined that this would be the best time to talk about uh, the Longfellow Center and then also give everyone an update on our master facilities plan and potential referendum in 2022. So as we start the presentation, one of the first slides that we always start off with no matter what we're doing is our mission and vision of the school district. Um, definitely during a pandemic and when times are tight budget wise, which also takes place in, in, in a pandemic, we always want to focus back on what is our core mission and vision and what we're trying to accomplish as a school district. So this is always centers us and grounds us in our work. Specifically, when we're talking about facilities, uh, in 2018, the district completed one of the most comprehensive plans I've ever had the privilege of working with. And the third goal was securing the future, which is goal number three. And in that goal, it calls for the district to really take a look at its facilities, see how we can reinvest in our facilities, improve our facilities, and then specifically, it does talk about Longfellow and ASC in addition to our schools. Having 13 facilities in our school district is going to make that number very large, especially with the current state of many of our buildings. And so as we look to identify with our architects and our strategic plan and our master facility groups, we targeted $244 million. Uh, that is our initial budget estimate in terms of what needs to be done across all of our schools. That is a very, very large number. In that number, a, a big bulk of that is simple maintenance that either has been deferred or that the district didn't have the funds to uh, put into place. So you'll see the first line, and I know it might be challenging to read, uh, where it says maintenance, $115 million. We've actually gotten that down since this was uh, put out. We did that through restructuring bonds and by reprioritizing things inside of our um, budgets. And so that number is actually closer to about $111 million right now. Safe and healthy environments is around $60 million. 21st century learning is $13.9 million. And grade level configuration is around $54.7 million. As we get to the end of this presentation, after we discuss Longfellow, we'll talk about the need to bring that citizen task force back for the master facility plan for our 13 schools, because the priorities may have significantly changed as a result of COVID and the virus. So for instance, safe and healthy environments when we were talking about putting in air conditioning and making significant upgrades to our HVAC system, 
That was one that may have been a little further down on the list, where now with COVID, that may actually be at the top of the list. And so it's important that we take a look at all of those. Some general background information. Uh, we also presented to the board in February, so this is intended to be uh, just kind of a summary slide. I know many in the audience live next to Longfellow or very close to it, so you, you know this probably just as well as I do. Uh, Longfellow closed as an attendance center in 1979. Since that time, it served multiple purposes over the year. Uh, originally, it started off as a rental. Uh, it then quickly moved in to serve multiple purposes, sometimes at the same time, other times separately. It served as a storage, a media center, professional development center. We used to have our regular board meetings at Longfellow, but if you've been in that space, obviously you know why we moved to the village hall. It just simply wouldn't work and people were in the hallways and it, it became very problematic when there were big issues to discuss. Our current use, we are still using it for storage and a media center, but it really serves as a second admin center and the home to the district's technology and maintenance departments. Longfellow Center, no longer in our opinion as an administration, meets the needs of the school district. We have significant space concerns. We have significant maintenance needs in that building along with all of our other buildings. And it also divides the administration, meaning that some of us are housed on the building on 63rd Street and some of us are housed over at uh, Longfellow. Now one of the most common questions I get is, well, why is it that way? Because it hasn't always been that way. Longfellow right now, we use the big room in the center of Longfellow, the former board room, as our professional development center. And so it's important that the Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Learning be located there because he's doing many of uh, his tasks and working with groups in that building. Technology is also there because that is where a lot of our work, that is where a lot of the uh, clerical assistants are located, and so that's why our admin team is divided. Ideally, you would want everybody in the same space. The site likely wouldn't be used to build another school or an administrative center. And let me explain why I would say something like that. In terms of building a school, when we're looking at uh, building standards, we work very closely with our architectural firm, White & Company. White & Company, their general rule of thumb is five acres for an elementary school, that's where you start, and then for every 100 students, you add another acre. So the current site sits at 3.2. Now, several of our buildings are not up to that standard because they've been built, you know, uh, or they were built a very long time ago. But with that standard, if we were looking to build a future school, of course we would be trying to hit that standard because otherwise you're not gonna have room for playgrounds and parking and, and all sorts of things that a modern school building requires. In terms of an administrative center, we have kind of a unique situation in Downers Grove. It's not very common to see an administrative center in the middle of a neighborhood. Typically you're gonna put that on a busier road like you would see right now where my office is at or District 99's. So if we were to build an administrative center, we would be recommending targeting a different location, whether it's right next to our current ASC on 63rd Street, or even on the Puffer property around Belmont Avenue. It's a much more convenient spot for an administrative center rather than right in the middle of a neighborhood. So some more background information on the Longfellow Center. If you've been in District 58 for a long time like I have, you know that this has been discussed for decades with a continual focus since the early 2000s. We've done many short-term maintenance fixes to that building. Uh, one thing that I would like to point out, and, and this is why it, it's more of an urgent matter to discuss the Longfellow Center. In 2011, there was a, a pretty lengthy debate on whether or not we should be replacing the roof. Roofs are one of our biggest ticket items that we have as a school district when we're talking about facilities and maintenance. The board rejected in 2011 putting a roof on the Longfellow School. A year later, the board came back and passed a temporary roof, wanting to give it some time to determine the long-term uses of that facility. We have a 10-year warranty on that roof. Uh, so that is next year when the warranty expires on that roof. And what we've learned from many of our other roofs is those warranties usually expire right when the roof starts to fail. A great example of that is Pierce Downer. So we potentially have a very costly repair coming up for the Longfellow Center. That is something that we all have to be very cognizant of. We've also had several recent conversations, again, as I highlighted at the beginning, with Longfellow and our Citizen Task Force. Now, our Citizen Task Force was designed for focusing the work on the 13 schools. We did discuss Longfellow and the AAC at the Citizen Task Force, but really, 
Longfellow in the ASC has always been viewed as a separate thing that could move without the work of the task force or it can move in conjunction with the work of the task force. In terms of the current board, obviously our conversations about all things facility have been ongoing with the district leadership team because of what we called for in the strategic plan. We had a meeting in March of 2020, right before COVID-19 really hit, where we had talked about moving forward with a referendum and we really had started or refreshed the conversations on the Longfellow Center. We also had a meeting, a public meeting about Longfellow in 2021, just two months ago in February. The Financial Advisory Committee has spent a great deal of time talking about the Longfellow Center. In fact, we meet monthly as a Financial Advisory Committee and this has been an ongoing topic since at least January. So for the last four meetings, this has been front and center as we've discussed that. The Financial Advisory Committee is a group that's really sole purpose of this group is to provide this board and the administration with solid advice about how to move forward all things financial. That group has indicated to us that they recommend moving forward. The Superintendent's Community Advisory Council has also advocated for moving forward. So the last time I met with the Superintendent Community Advisory Council, we had split into groups and I had asked them questions about a potential referendum, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and then the work uh, moving forward with the potential sale of Longfellow. We split the group up and shared with them kind of where the FAC was at, conversations at the board level, and both groups in the Superintendent Community Advisory Council also recommended that we move forward. I know I've received several emails today about not involving the community and not discussing this with the community. I want to assure everyone here that we have put this through several filters of community groups that help advise us. So we, we don't just make decisions in a vacuum. We have certainly discussed uh, this uh, with several different groups and councils, as well as up here in public board meetings. Additionally, we had a small working group that was led by Todd Dreyfall. That small working group consisted of some members of the FAC, former board members, that also got together to uh, discuss the pros and cons of a potential sale of Longfellow. I will point out that that group was not unanimous in its recommendation moving forward. Some people on the group strongly opposed it, while some people were in favor of moving forward with a potential sale. So why consider changing the status quo now? One of the things, as I pointed out, in terms of a liability, deferring maintenance through the years is a liability to the school district. We had several situations this winter with broken pipes at schools like Herrick or boilers not working at schools like Fairmount. And we averted catastrophe several times this summer due to our, or excuse me, this winter due to our aging infrastructure. So the longer you defer maintenance, the bigger bills you're going to uh, have catch up with you and potentially impact the learning of our children. As we look at the valuation of the property at Longfellow, the sale could result in $2.5 million in revenue. Now that is a conservative estimate. One of the reasons that's a conservative estimate is when we talk about setting the sale of a property in the district, should the board choose to do that, that is done permissible or, or you're allowed to do that in closed session for obvious reasons you don't want to impact the potential revenue of a sale. COVID-19 certainly impacted our referendum. We were moving forward with a referendum that we would have uh, put up on the ballot. We had to pause that work because of COVID-19 and the impact that it had on the economy. So one of the things that resulted from that is a reprioritization of our order of things that we were going to look at in terms of Longfellow ASC and the rest of the buildings. I do want to point out to everyone two things about a potential referendum, and again, we'll discuss this. Referendums are not an easy thing to pass in District 58 or really any community. And also, even if we were to pass a referendum, the task force had recommended a referendum of $179 million, which again, I'll be very upfront with everyone. That is a big ask for any community. If you notice that number, that number was 244 million with identified needs. So a referendum still would not cure everything that we would have to solve in terms of our facility. So very tough decisions still have to be made even if a referendum were to pass. If a referendum doesn't pass, then you've got some other difficult decisions ahead. A big chunk of that, as I shared, about $111 million is deferred maintenance. These are the inners of your buildings, your pipes, your electrical, the really 
not necessarily the glamorous things like you might see at the 99 referendum with fields and, and, and science labs. These are the bare bone things to keep our 13 schools afloat. One of the things I would continue to recommend is that as we move forward, we always embrace that flexibility and that new thinking when it comes to our schools because if we continue to defer some of these things, we're gonna end up in a very, very tough spot. So as we looked at the Longfellow Center, we did review several options. Uh, full disclosure, I'm sure that there are options that we didn't review or that people would have liked us to review, but here is where we centered our work. We took a look at the status quo. What should we be doing just, you know, in the status quo, we looked at deferred maintenance only on the Longfellow Center, basically keeping the, the two split. Um, the ASC also needs significant work to it. Our ASC right now, where the restrooms are facing Indian Trail, if you look outside there, we have hay bales outside there to prevent the pipes from freezing. That is how, what well, really in dire straits our facilities are. I want to assure the public that when we're talking about our facility needs, we are not talking about anything fancy or anything over the top. We are talking about basic facility needs. We have hay bales outside of the ASC right now to prevent pipes from freezing. So there is a lot of work that needs to take place. Our boards and our taxpayers have done wonderful things with, with very small budgets, but eventually some of the things are gonna come due. Another option that we looked at is renovating both. And in this particular option, we would look at moving the storage, moving the technology, moving all of the curriculum storage and, and, and some of those maintenance things into the ASC building on 63rd Street, which if you're not familiar with that building, it basically is a, is a concrete structure much better suited than the current school for storage and things like that. And then the entire admin team would then move over to the Longfellow Center. We've also been discussing uh, renovating a current school. So what would it look like if we went into a current school? There certainly is space, especially in some of our schools on the south side. But one of the things that we do with any unused space in our school district is we rent that out to SASIT, which is our special education cooperative. Not only does that help generate revenue for the school district, but a cause that's near and dear to all of us is we want our students with significant special needs to be here in District 58 to the greatest extent possible. So by hosting those programs, yes, we do have students from other districts um, that those districts pay for, but we also have our own students that are able to be here in District 58. We also talked about building a new ASC center um, and using one of the current two buildings for storage purposes um, at Indian Trail or Longfellow. We talked about leasing a new administrative space and that would include then selling Longfellow in the current administrative center becomes your technology and maintenance hub. And then we talked about a partnership with the village of Downers Grove and prior to COVID we were very close and I recognize that people in this room have said, well, we've heard that before and we've been very close two times about potentially partnering with the village of Downers Grove. The village of Downers Grove, like District 58, had to put many of their plans on hold and as a result, we're left um, really on our own as a school district determining how we can move forward with our administrative centers. So with that, I'm gonna kick it over to our Assistant Superintendent for Business, Todd Drayfall. And Todd's gonna walk through some of the costs that we took a look at. <clears throat> and so to remind the board, uh, when we first, we've been, as we've you know, said, we've talked about and been working on this for some time as part of the master's facility planning process. Um, but really, when we came into December with the financial uh, workshop uh, on December 7th, we had proposed a restructure of where we were at with our financing, with looking at that master's facilities plan. Uh, and instead of going at a referendum, which obviously was on hold, looking at restructuring our bond and our debt, uh, issuing some of those bonds, and the board did that through uh, in March, so that we were able to handle and manage some of the, the, the biggest issues we've had, some mechanical equipment, some buildings, the pierced down a roof, uh, and some asphalt that is failing throughout um, the worst uh, areas of uh, parking and asphalt area uh, in the district. Uh, that was step one. Uh, we were able to take advantage of the market with very low rates at that point and restructure that. 
Step two was then looking at this aspect and figuring out what could we do uh, with Longfellow, understanding that it is not a school site um, now or in the future, and what you know, what is the capacity, and what can we do with that while we are in the process of moving forward with the rest of that master's facility plan in whatever function, whether it be referendum or restructuring or whatever that case may be. Uh, so to continue the process of continually making improvements and continually making and working to effect a change on that hundred and some odd million dollars of deferred maintenance and the updates that are buildings in need. I mean, that four million dollar differential, some of that is obviously in the, in the uh, items that you're going to approve this evening or that have already approved the roof. Some of those are in the playground uh, projects that other groups that, that pa group parents have raised uh, or that we receive state grants for. Uh, and so we've, since that 115 started two years ago, we've been able to whittle some of that down and we continually work to do that. Cost of operating Longfellow. Um, it is true. We spend very, 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 very little money on uh, operating Longfellow. It's $32,000 a year. Um, it looks it. Um, what we really need to be spending, and we look at the improvements that we should start to do if we were to continue to keep it and operate it, is we need to start spending more than that. We need to start spending and updating and working on um, equipment and updates. And that comes out to when we take over the next 10 years, our estimates um, provided, you know, working with the architect and working with uh, contractors, with masonry work and so forth, about 107, another 85,000 or 117 total. <coughs> that doesn't include the boilers that we've had repaired that at some point will fail um, and need to be replaced. And it doesn't include the $75,000 fire alarm system that when, as we were, and some of these numbers have continued to change as we work through this. One was we had a gentleman in with working on the fire alarms and he said, just so you know, it's end of service. We can't repair it. If you, if you need, if it breaks, if it fails, it's a full replacement at $75,000. So that's some of the level that we're at. Um, and to understand that those, those expenses are, are there and they're real and, you know, it, it has that, that the potential that liability. <coughs> As we work through, um, and you'll see on, the, on this presentation a very shortened table, so it's readable in the bottom line, uh, but in the memo it has a little more uh, detail flushed out uh, as to the estimates and how we came up with them. Uh, we worked with uh, our architect. We worked with contractors coming in and giving us some estimates uh, on masonry and tuck pointing. Uh, we have a 2012 report that the architects that the district spent a considerable amount of money on to update and, and to, to look at its facilities. Uh, we had the architects estimators update those numbers to current numbers to get an estimate of renovation of the property. Um, if we were looking at a capital replacement piece for a brand new building, uh, we used what estimates they had as a how much per square foot that they were seeing coming in on bids for public jobs. Understanding the public jobs are different than private, we have a we have a different labor rate than most, and so we have to you know, take that into account. If, and because we wanted to make sure we didn't pad something or show whatever, if they gave us a range, if it was 185 to 210, we went at the one, we, we, for a capital project, we did the 185. We didn't you know, go at the high number because we wanted to make sure we didn't get accused of inflating you know, capital numbers for, for the purpose of showing what they were. Um, and so that, in that case, you know, we made sure that we were coming up with, with what those were. And, and for the most part, I mean, we have moving costs in there. We did have two movers or three movers come through and give us estimates as to what it would be to move different aspects of ASC and Longfellow, because obviously that's part of those overall costs. Um, and so that is how we've come up with a lot of the, you know, come up with the reports and the numbers that you see. Um, and then Kevin Bardo and his team put those together. On the revenue side, um, 
we have updated those as well because we've got proper, new property in and what our tax information is, and you'll see that in your reports for the, the report this month, um, and updated those and took a, the average CPI number that we've been using of 1.7 and took lower uh, growth numbers in consideration so that when we estimated out how, as well as a lower house value uh, or what we thought was a decent house value of 800000 and applied that through the property tax extension limitation law and adjusting for and coming up with what we thought would be a low revenue number once it was fully completed and fully built out. Um, in fact, I actually, <coughs> this is the part where my wife keeps telling me don't geek out because I get too much into, because I have a level of done doing property taxes. I had to average back in some things and and put in the new property when it comes off. And so, but we think that those are pretty pretty close to uh, the low end of what they would be when, when that property, if that property was fully developed as residential property. Actually, for that matter, we took it at 11, not 12 lots. Given all of that, oops. All right, track it for We come up with our table that Again, as a summary piece, um, through the, uh, the FAC and through um, some asks and working with a uh, small group and stuff, uh, uh, asking for additional information, we were able to really flush out a variety of, of su suggestions and levels and things to, to look at. So we've always had to build on ASC, uh, renovating and, and purchase a property um, I will tell you as we work through this my initial thinking was oh this won't cost that much I think the first one we did two years ago was purchase and renovate space I didn't think it was going to cost that much money until we started looking and we worked with uh, Michael Casa to come up with what's a what's a property that has and again the right amount of parking off-street parking for us given the professional development needs we have, um, given the space that we need. <clears throat> and it was not, it was a, a larger number than expected. And then we worked with the architects to come up with what's our average cost for construction and renovation. Um, that's how we came up to all of these numbers. Um, the group came up with making sure we put a, a gross and a net to understand the difference of when we talk about the financial impact of holding on to or selling Longfellow, what that looks like and what that differential is. Um, also in there is on some of those capital pieces, a five year uh, cost for holding on to the property because if we continue, there's a cost for that and how does that work out uh, and what does that look like? And so what you see there is in the, is in the final piece is a net cost per square foot or a net amount of money, um, net cost for, for doing one of the, making one of those decisions. Um, certainly one of the cheaper ends is simply renovating uh, the Longfellow piece on, a, on an overall at 2.3 million, uh, but that doesn't adjust the items that uh, Dr. Russell has talked about with the split command system and the split support system for the district as well as you know, the additional long-term impact of it. We then uh, looked at lease costs, and I will tell you, I, I have worked in districts, we have leased space for central administration, um, and it was a much smaller structure, made sense. Um, we've moved from in and out, from into lease space, out of lease space. Uh, I will tell you my first, when we first started talking about this two, three years ago with the FAC and several members had proposed this, I wasn't necessarily sold on the idea. Um, it didn't make sense of 20 some odd years of government that this made sense. The more we continue to look at this option for us and for the conditions that we're in and the space that we're looking at, it makes sense. Uh, it makes sense on a short and 
medium to term basis uh, that the district look at uh, look at it in this in this factor given one the site that we have and its long term level of not needing that site and not being able to build on that site not being able to expand on that site um, as well as the overall needs of the district in our schools and our classrooms and that level and that cost uh, beyond what we would you know traditionally borrow or you know, could issue debt for uh, in the near future and with the current structure and market again looking at advantages just like we did with the bonds we were able to take advantage of the conditions as they are today and use those to our advantage for this term um, so now looking at that lease cost it looks like an expensive piece on an operational basis on an annual basis but when we look at compare it to what we really need to be spending and what if we continue with longfellow what we would have to start spending take into account the fact that we have an immediate in this you know operational savings of some staff consolidations and reconfiguration and not that we wouldn't have some more down the road that would lend to this uh, but you know at this point that's something we would not commit to and wouldn't want to put into the table but looking at what we know we can deal with right now and adjust that comes down to a fifty thousand dollar delta uh, from year to year from current to the following year uh, and gives us some potential some funds to be used into the next into the summer of 2022 for work in schools <clears throat> looking at the revenue as I've said um, property is subdivided into 12 lots uh, zoned is R3 <clears throat> if we were to consider on a conservative piece 11 homes uh, at eight hundred thousand dollars to be built over a three levy year purpose structure um, we believe that that would turn out to be about a sixty three thousand dollar final valuation uh, add to the district uh, in revenue to the district we would start to see initial money as soon as uh, depending on sale time as soon as the following year because it would come as new property from exempt status to taxed status and that has a new property value added on for property tax extension and then from that point whatever development as it builds would go into that as well <clears throat> so as we get to um, the administration's recommendation please know that comes with a, a, a lot of conversations at the FAC here in um, you know this particular setting and then also other settings throughout the school district so the administration is recommending that we do move forward with the sale of the Longfellow Center that we lease office space because that allows for flexibility and future review eliminates need for capital expenditures at Longfellow frees up capital funding for 2022 school improvement projects allows for property tax revenue from new homes that are eventually built on the site and it would consolidate the administrative services into one location I want to spend some time talking about the rationale for this recommendation and I apologize that there's so many things on on one slide here so please bear with me this further demonstrates to our community that the board administration are committed to being fiscally responsible by taking a look at property that does doesn't serve a purpose for us anymore as a school district one of the challenges that I have as a superintendent is to bring that back to the board and have a conversation per our strategic plan which really outlined that we should be looking at what are the future uses for these facilities this is a typo we don't feel that Longfellow is a good investment at this particular time uh, the reason for that is we really feel like with the limited funds that we have we need to focus our resources on our schools the reason for that is we don't feel the Longfellow site is ideal for a future admin center or a school. I've had many emails asking, this building is not beyond disrepair, you can still pay to fix it. A absolutely, you could pay to fix any building in our school district. I, I want to make that point. The point is with limited funds, where are we going to choose to place our funds? 
And I do have concerns that Longfellow renovations would cause cuts to district programs and make other things like full day kindergarten much tougher to accomplish. Here in District 58, we aren't able to offer a lot of the same facility things that our comparable districts do. One example of that is we've heard from several PTAs over the years about how frustrated they are that they need to raise money on their own for playgrounds in the schools. We don't have capital funds to pay for things like that. We've also heard from many of our families the frustration about not being able to offer a full day kindergarten program. We do have an extended kindergarten program, but it is at a fee and a cost to our families. So if we're devoting resources to put into Longfellow, obviously the, that fund or those funds have to come from somewhere and they would have to come from other areas in the budget at a time where we've already identified significant capital needs and other priorities in the strategic plan. We've also talked a great deal about the need for interventions and specialists coming out of the pandemic to make sure that we work with kiddos that may be behind through no fault of their own because <coughs> of the situation that they've been in. Uh, this would make it more challenging. This issue has been debated for decades, and I do believe that it's time to take action on the Longfellow Center. Do I wish in the same year we didn't have to talk about a pandemic and selling a building? Uh, absolutely. Um, these are not the first two years that I envisioned as your superintendent, I can assure you that. Uh, trust me on that one. However, when I took this job as a superintendent, one of the things that the Board of Education stressed with me was that we have a strategic plan that the community came together and we really want to see that strategic plan implemented to the greatest extent possible in this five-year period. The strategic plan does call for Longfellow and the ASC to be addressed. The real estate market and current interest rates make this an ideal time to sell and lease. That's not me talking, that's people like the Downers Grove Economic Development Corporation sharing that. This move provides a short-term solution and long-term options. One of the things that I've also heard a lot of is you don't have a long-term plan. What are you gonna do down the road? And, and, and I would push back on that. Um, I have worked in districts, uh, Hinsdale being an example, where they've decided that with their administrative center, they're just gonna lease it in perpetuity. Now you do you know, subject yourself to the whims of the market and things like that, so you have to be careful of it, but that is one option you have moving forward. Another option that you have moving forward is the bonds. We just refinance bonds in the school district. Those bonds will be up in 10 years where then you can also extend debt service extension limit. You could use another debt service extension limit to pay for a new administrative center. The short term options that this gives you is it gives you immediate capital to address your needs that we've identified as a community and with our architects that we have to do that. Another potential option down the road is another partnership with the village of Downers Grove once they're ready. Uh, as we sit in this room as well, it's no secret that uh, this is an aging facility. The concrete is crumbling as you walk in. You can see the roof leaking. The village is very interested in moving forward with their proposal as well. We also have the option down the road of going into a school or adding on to a school as well should we want to explore that option. So there are long-term options available to the board. I truly believe that we must continue to think differently as a district if we want to upgrade our schools, programs, and facilities. I'm gonna turn it over to Todd before we get to questions on a recommendation and the timeline along with this. So the action that you have before you this evening is, uh, is one just for us to start to, to, to continue and to start spending a little bit more money to get an appraisal, uh, to move forward, uh, and to put in position um, you know, placement for you uh, as a board uh, to make a decision on, on resolution. Um, school code is, is on selling of real property is specific about the structure and how uh, a, a school board uh, can do it. You pass a resolution, uh, 60 days later there's a bid open, uh, for, for resolution to bid for a sealed bid. Uh, 60 days later we open the bids and the most responsive bidder to that bid uh, with the highest price uh, is the winner of the bid. And, you know, and that's, that's it. Um, there are, you know, limits to stipulations, but there is uh, structure and there's some precedence of school districts stating that it must be a for-profit entity uh, versus a non-for-profit and have pick it and picked a bid that is a for-profit so that it goes under the tax rolls over 
a not-for-profit organization. Uh, you know, that has happened in the past and is something that can be put in there according to our terms. Um, earliest that the board could do a resolution would be March. <coughs> uh, we would start working on plans as well uh, with approval for the architect to start working on the ASC renovation plans, uh, prepare shop drawings and, and to put uh, bid docs together to put that out. Bids would be due on Longfellow in July uh, with a closing sometime in August and a rent back which we would build into the bid uh, for a period of time until the district has both secured lease, um, moved the administration teams out of their respective facilities, renovated ASC, and, and then moved um, maintenance and, and storage and warehouse and curriculum storage out of it, out of Longfellow. Um, the server move of the servers out of it is that's already in the works and moving forward. And that's on your, actually that's on your approval for this evening. Um, and then we would move in summer, fall um, in that format. So just to clarify, Todd, I, I, I think you said we couldn't move forward until March. I, I think Todd meant May. I'm, uh, I'm <laughs> fine. Um, one of the other Thank things you. that we did go over quickly are two common questions that I get about this property. Is the park district interested and in why don't you sell it to the Downers Grove Park District? I can tell you that we have reached out to the park district and while I cannot speak for the park board, I can just share with you the conversations that we have had. Um, in terms of the park district strategic plan, they have indicated that they are not interested in the, the property at this particular time. So we did do our due diligence and talk with the Downers Grove Park District in terms of uh, the executive director, Bill McAdam. Another common question that I get is stormwater concerns. I will be the first one to tell you that I am the furthest thing uh, from a civil engineer and I am not qualified to speak about stormwater retention or anything. I can tell you that I, we have spoken with the village here are the village officials at length about stormwater and what are the requirements. The village can answer any and all questions as it relates to stormwater, but I can assure you if this project does move forward, anyone who puts anything on these lots would be required to meet the village's standards for stormwater and water retention, as well as building restrictions, lot coverage, all of those things. Having built a home in the last six years, I can tell you that it is much more rigorous, obviously, than when schools were built. I do recognize there are several concerns in our community about that, um, but the village would be the ones who are responsible for making sure <coughs> that anything that is built on this land or taken off of this land is done so in the proper manner. Okay. So at this point, we have a break to see if the board has any questions. Uh, you may have, you may want to save your questions till later when we talk about the action item, but are there any clarifying questions that we may have? And then we'll briefly talk about potential timing for the other facility needs in a referendum. Well, Kevin and Todd, I did just want to say thank you so much for the presentation tonight. And I just want to say that as a person who's uh, chaired the DLT since it was formed after the strategic plan, and someone who's either sat on the FAC or chaired it over the last four years. I've had a front row seat to the tremendous amount of work that has gone into this. So, um, so I just wanted to say thank you for that. And I open up the floor to anyone who's got questions or comments uh, for Todd, Kevin, or I believe Kevin Bardo is in here somewhere as well. We're in the audience. Kevin Bardo is our director of buildings and grounds. <coughs> uh, Todd, I have a quick question. Well, I don't, maybe it's quick. Um, you mentioned in your presentation that you were at first a, um, a skeptic when it comes to renting a, a, an administrative facility, um, but then you uh, have since come around to a different way of thinking. Can you just give me a little bit more detail, expound upon how, how you came to that, that conversion? <clears throat> Given the fact that, obviously, if you own a piece of property, you have to keep it up, and there's a cost to that, and, and there's a growing cost. On, on maintenance, uh, capital, and you need to, you know, ideally be building funds aside to help manage that piece. We're an education institution. We have 13 buildings, uh, 600,000 square feet ish. 675,000 675, square feet of classrooms. Um, 
that's the space that we need to own and maintain and make sure is up because that's what we do every day is take care of kids and educate them um, space for staff and you know professional development and for adults um, there are besides owning and managing and maintaining um, there are other opportunities that have some economies that are able to that we're able to use and maintain and, and, and helps lower our oversight and our cost we don't have to maintain it yes we're paying for that in, in the lease and we're paying for a variety of things and I know we'll be paying for taxes but it relieves our need to help manage one more site given and particularly given our condition where we have the level of deferred maintenance that we have um, but the cost piece that we came up with and reviewed um, wasn't significantly skewed against leasing in fact it's a, you know it's advantageous at this point uh, in my mind to do so uh, for the, the you know for that that office space and given that there are some reasonable market um, properties out there that are level uh, that are grade B uh, rent space um, and some of those those quotes that we have in there are numbers without negotiation so presumably they should come down some uh, it makes it um, very very uh, interesting to do so and, and the possibility of, of you know for positive for the district thanks Todd uh, question maybe for you or for Kevin uh, currently Longfellow is used for a number of purposes I know some of that would then in the recommendation shift to the ASC in its current form uh, I know that one of the uses for Longfellow is sometimes using it for PD space mm -hmm. is the vision that we would then use leased space for staff professional development or where would that shift to yeah that is that is correct and, and so the vision would be to have professional development in the same area where our administrative offices would be. So ideally you would, you would want to target an area where you could do the professional development in the same center that you would do your admin space and then also your smaller board meetings like a committee meeting or something like that because all the sound equipment and everything that you would need would be located in one visit or one spot, excuse me. Anything else? Okay, so quickly as we move into the citizen task force, I did want to update everyone. And this really came out, out of a conversation that we had with the superintendent's community advisory council, which I know there are members of this council in this room. And, and for those who are listening at home, I want to thank them uh, for their hard work and, and often their, their candid advice that they give to me. So one of the things I asked uh, the superintendent's community advisory council was, we know that we felt very strongly before about going forward with a potential referendum to meet the district's facility needs. The, the citizen task force felt the same way. I asked them, is it too soon to start talking about that due to COVID? Is it just the right amount of time to start talking about that due to COVID? Or should we have already started? I can tell you both groups overwhelmingly share with me we should have already started having those conversations while I reassured them uh, that there was still plenty of time. They're certainly from a superintendent's community advisory council and from uh, members of the task force that have indicated to me, you know, just in conversation that they'd like to start the conversation up again. The good news is a lot of our work has already taken place, uh, but as we alluded to before, we have to have a conversation about those priorities that we set because the pandemic could have flipped some of those or put things like air quality number one where before that might have not even made the list so just as a brief uh review of the history of the citizens task force really before the world changed we had a meeting on march 2nd i believe last year 2020 and the task force had strongly indicated that the board of education go forward uh, seeking the potential of a 179 million dollar referendum to fix all 13 of our schools put air conditioning and other air improvements in our schools and then also reconfigure our middle schools to incorporate sixth grade we then had a meeting as a board of education 
uh, at the ASC Center where we talked about starting an informational push and we started to talk about sending out mailers and then potentially doing uh, polling, working with Paul Hanley, the same uh, person who helped District 99 in their referendum. And we, we picked Paul because Paul knew our community very, very well. And then obviously the world changed and COVID-19 hit and everything came to a grinding halt when the economy shut down. Many, many families in Downers Grove were negatively impacted. We weren't sure if the government was going to be able to assist people. And so therefore we have paused the work of the Citizen Task Force. And I say paused because we always had the intention of bringing it back. And again, uh, what we're looking at now is a timeline of, um, you know, targeting March of 22 for that potential referendum. So if we did move forward with that, you'd be looking at the spring and summer, ongoing communications <coughs> from the district. Obviously, we would have to get very creative because the number of people that you can have in a space, but if the pandemic has taught us anything like tonight's meeting, you can have people in person and online and sometimes actually capture more people uh, into the conversation. Public forums with building tours, as I just talked about, uh, task force meetings. I spoke to Paul Hanley last week and one of the things that we talked about is, you know, is it appropriate, when is it appropriate to bring back the task force? You know, we, we both felt very strongly as to Todd that it is appropriate to bring back the task force uh, especially for that prioritization conversation. And Paul was recommending that early summer, we bring them back uh, to do that. November of 2021 would be your final task force meeting. And then December of 21, the board would be asked potentially, if that's what the task force is recommending again, uh, to adopt a ballot question, which would then go uh, on the election or for March of 22. In terms of a timeline, we've included a draft timeline. Please note this is a draft. But this kind of gives you an idea of the things that we would target month by month. Some things you're just targeting one, other months you're targeting uh, multiple ones. Todd, can you flip that one? Yep. Thank you. And so this is the timeline uh, that we're taking a look at based on the feedback uh, that we received. Again, no final decisions would be made uh, about a referendum. I keep using the word potential and that's very deliberate. Uh, I am not going to make any bones about it. A referendum is a very tough thing to pass, especially when you have 13 schools and the amount of work that needs to be done in our school. So that number may come down a little bit, that number could increase a little bit. Really, that's what we rely on that Citizen Task Force Group <coughs> to identify that. But a referendum by no means is a slam dunk whatsoever. Uh, it's gonna take a lot of work and um, we have to go into it with our eyes wide open should we wanna pursue that. Questions on that? Anybody? Uh, I have some, some thoughts. Um, so I, I thank you, Kevin, for explaining that. I guess um, if we go back to that March of 2020 meeting, I think I was um, the most hesitant to sign on to the idea of the referendum at that time. The reason being because I think we had a, had, had some conversations as a, as a board about where we felt comfortable with our ask of the community and i felt at that meeting at that um in, at, that was back at the asc in march of 2020 that we um in my opinion haphazardly jumped that ask by quite a bit i think we were kind of talking like 75 to 100 and then it was like 125 and then at that meeting i think we just totally jumped to 179 um with um and it was, it was to me, it was um, like, I felt it was very sudden and it wasn't, it was just, um, I, I needed more time to get there, to, to feel comfortable with that number. And at, at that time, I was not there. Mm -hmm. And uh, since we have not talked about this at all, um, 13 months later, I am still not there as a board <laughs> member. Um, when, we, when we took our, our list of everything we wanted and pretty much put most of it on the list, um, I felt that we, um, just jumped in a little bit too quickly there for my comfort level. Uh, since then, we've had a you know an unprecedented um, pandemic, an economic downturn. Um, I, I feel like you know I, we always appreciate you know a, a, the big theme of the night is is community engagement, and we talked about how we had a lot of community engagement with Longfellow, um, and we talked about how we're going to have continued community engagement on this referendum item. We talked about the superintendent superintendent's advisory council and the citizens task force. 
Um, my concern is in that situation, um, a lot of those committees, and I've sat on some of them, and I've um, had the opportunity to, to see who's, who's represented there. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's always a good representation of our entire community. You know, you're not gonna see a lot of, um, you're not gonna see a lot of the families who are the hardest hit by this pandemic and this economic downturn have the time to serve on those committees. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna serve, see a lot of um, senior citizens on a fixed income who don't have children or grandchildren in our schools serving on those committees. So I'm concerned about how, the, how this referendum would impact um, that, that's that segment of our population who probably aren't represented. Who, we're not hearing their voices currently. So I guess um, I, I'm, I'm seeing, you know, I see, I see the, uh, the timeline here. Um, tell me how we're going to kind of re-engage and how we're going to um, make sure that, I mean, I, 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 in some ways I feel like we're just kind of picking up where we left off. Mm -hmm. So tell me how we're going to re-engage and make sure that we are still hearing from our community, we're still, um, developing a, uh, a package to put on the ballot that represents their needs, represents the needs of our school and our, and our families and our students, but also is um, considerate of, of the people we serve, of the taxpayers, and is um, appropriate given the experiences of our community over the past year plus. Yeah. So I, I appreciate that question. And so in terms of whether or not an, a certain number is appropriate or you know whether it's 80 million, 100 million, 150 million, 179 million, and it's even challenging to say those numbers because they're huge, right? That is exactly why you work with someone like Paul Hanley. Not only, uh, you know, when we combine with Marsha Shut or Marsha Sutter and we do community engagement and, and tours and meetings to, to talk about these things, but you also have scientific polling that goes along with it. And one of the things that we had talked about as a board and that I'll continue to emphasize as a superintendent it makes absolutely zero sense if your community engagement process and your polling process comes back and they tell you you don't have a chance of moving forward with this then one of the things i've said over and over again is we're not going to put or at least my recommendation would not put the community through that because ultimately it, it's the board's recommendation um, there are countless examples throughout illinois where people have really used that community engagement process and the polling process and, and listen and then made a decision. There's also examples, there was one up north recently where they didn't listen and they went through it anyway and it failed. And so I think we have to really engage our community, not just those parents that wanna see the immediate impact on their families, although that's important. We also wanna make sure that we're demonstrating to people in our community, the 70% of people who don't have kids in our schools, that this is a wise investment you're making on your home moving forward. We have to convince people that what we're talking about is the right thing to do in terms of investing in your schools. And that's really where the science behind the polling comes in. And so to ensure that we've hit those people, it's really targeting those groups and inviting them in for the community engagement process and those open dialogues, but also really backing it up with some heavy duty polling to make sure that we're truly grasping where our community is at. And that would take place around October prior to that last task force meeting before they make a final recommendation to the board. So in terms of in between what's going to happen between now and November, December, the community and the Board of Education are going to have additional opportunities to re reassess um, and to reconsider what we, what our needs are, what our wants are. And so in, in terms of what I said, like I felt like we were picking back the pieces up. There, it's, nothing is, is really a foreground conclusion at this point in time. Mm -hmm. We're still gonna be um, considering, considering different uh, alter alternatives, um, exploring different scenarios, and uh, what we eventually come up with potentially in the, the, the winter months may look very similar to what we came up with a year ago, or we could come through this, this process and come up with something that is bigger, smaller, right anywhere in between yeah. correct okay you know and i appreciate the opportunity to clarify so when i say a lot of the work has already been done what i'm talking about is a lot of the work has been done by our architects walking through and saying here's the need here's best practice here's the life cycle i think it is extremely important why i recommend that we get this group back together in you know june or july more likely june to say is this still a priority for our school district and are these priorities still where we thought they were what should our community engagement look like in terms of meetings and virtual opportunities and all those things, then go to polling if we even get there. And so, again, we may find out that, yes, you've got a couple of councils who are 
gung ho for something, but it just doesn't make sense for our community at this particular time. And so again, I will recommit to the board and the community that we're going to work closely with not only our task force, but also Paul Hanley to make sure that we don't bring anything in front of you that we don't think has a successful shot of passing. Kevin, thanks for uh, walking us through the timeline. <clears throat> I remember, Greg, when you shared a year ago, you felt like we made a leap that was haphazard. Um, and that might be not, not the right word, but like just seemed very, yeah. it seemed like a big jump really quickly for me. Haphazard, I know everybody thought it through carefully. So, yeah, I, just, I, I do want to address that because I, I think we all did think through it very carefully. Uh, I mean, what we're talking about are not cosmetic aesthetics, things that look shiny on a piece of paper. We're talking about boilers, uh, electrical, so that we don't create in-house fires. Uh, we're talking about roofing. Uh, a roof comes due nearly every year, if not every other year. Um, uh, we're, we're talking about uh, becoming ADA compliant in our buildings. We're talking about, uh, this is pre-pandemic, but improved ventilation in our buildings, which becomes even more relevant now going forward. Um, we're talking about secure vestibules, for ensuring the safety of our schools so that students are not exposed to any public member walking into buildings without being uh, pre-checked. Um, everything that I just shared gets us to 179. There's nothing in there that asks us to be over the top or over overboard. Um, there's no 21st century learning spaces in that number. Uh, that number doesn't even include getting our sixth graders uh, into uh, a middle school environment. We'd have to reshuffle yeah, maintenance is, needs. We had sixth grade. 796 in middle schools. Well, based on the numbers here, we have 115 for maintenance and 60 million for safety and health, uh, safe and health, uh, healthy environment. So but we didn't uh, take everything out there. of all of them. Like we, there was some stuff that right. we pulled out of maintenance. Some right. To and get so there. what yeah. I'm saying is that we pull things out of safety and health. We pull things out of maintenance yeah. to be able to make room for middle school arrangements. I don't think this was haphazard. I also don't think this is over the top. Um, I think we, as a district, as a few previous boards have had to do. Uh, have to make tough calls on tough budgets. Mm -hmm. um, that goes for tonight, that goes for future nights whenever we have to make choices. Um, so I, I don't want the narrative to be that we went haphazard and said, let's just go for shoot for the moon and get 179. We looked at the numbers and said, what does our district actually need? What do our students deserve? Uh, what can we make do with? And we left some things on the table that we all would have liked, but we knew that we needed to have some basic things for our, for our district. Um, so just wanted to address, and, and, address and all that. that's fair and, and you're right the word haphazard was not the right word to use however i just felt like considering how many of the the situations of some of our families many of our families have changed over the past year my my you know i'm not saying i'm, I'm I, I could be on board with 179 i could be on board with more or less you know we just have to have that, <coughs> that process i just want to make sure that we are um, talking to families again after many people have probably lost their jobs many people have um had subs like pretty big interruptions to their lives and I just uh, I want to make sure that we are um, considerate of how the pandemic has affected our community before we go forward by with raising our base taxes. Yeah, I, and I'm fully on board with that as well. Uh, we ultimately uh, answer to the community, and the community should give us additional updated guidance uh, on what they're looking for as we go towards a potential referendum or decide not to. Uh, and I think as a board, we should continue to remain indifferent as long as the community is asking us to lean one way or another. Um, and ultimately vote in the direction of where what's best for our students uh, with an input from the community. So I fully on board with continuing to engage the community, but I, I see that in uh, Kevin's plan, and so that timeline makes a lot of sense to me. Sounds good. And I think what I'm hearing as well is we don't fully understand the burden that's hit our community yet, and I think as we continue to open over the next few months, I think we'll be able to understand where people landed after the pandemic and the, and the shutdown and all of this kind of and so we've got to be careful about the burden that we put it at the feet of all the folks in our community and we I, and, and I know we hear good this is a good time to put out bonds because of rates and, and and that's all true and it's good to do these you know there's things that are very beneficial to being on this timeline and if we can make it work and it works for our community and it helps the kids and, and, and people can handle the burden that kind of comes from this, then I think a lot of us on, the, at, on this dais can get on board. But I think that's what we need to hear. We need to make sure because uh, 
we need to extend that timeline. We need to be open to that. If we need to move quickly, we need to be open to that. I think we need to look at what is best for our community at large. And it does, this whole mindset that we've been in for the last year is constantly changing because we're sort of reevaluating everything that's important to us and every building that we walk into. You know, we kind of laugh. We kept talking about air quality and people are going, that's just a fancy word for air conditioning. Now people are writing us going, is the air quality okay to bring our kids back to school? And so yes, the, the baseline information, all the architectural stuff is there. We know our baseline numbers and some of that might need to be tweaked a little bit, but we do need to take a couple steps back reprioritize, make sure we're still on the same page. We need to reach out not only to the citizen task force, but to the community at large and make sure that we're not missing anything before we start marching down a path that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. so, I, so I like the timeline, but I, I'm also open to extending that if it, if it needs to be done. Uh, but if we can do it in that time and the community can be behind it, then, then I'm, I'm with the team, you know. Sounds good. Anything else? No. Thank you. Okay. All right, listed on tonight's agenda are 29 communications received by the board. Are there any additional communication board members would like to share at this time? Okay, we'll move on to the reports to the board. We'll go ahead and start with the superintendent report. So first off, I'd like to start off tonight with a big thank you. On behalf of the Board of Education, I want to thank the Hillcrest Administration, PTA staff, for their presentation this evening. Definitely one of the most unique ones we had, so thank you very much. You did a great job. We're so very proud of all 13 of our schools and thoroughly enjoy when we have you here so we get to see all the great things that are taking place uh, in your schools. I uh, particularly want to compliment uh, both Ms. Smith and Ms. Zepka just for all the work that you've done along with our other administrators and, and staff changing and rechanging and in, in, in getting everything ready this school year the hours and the dedication are are very much appreciated so thank you very much and, and job well done in terms of uh curriculum instruction again just to piggyback off of that i am extremely proud to share that we are now all back full time uh both on site and remote our, our teams have done a wonderful job in all 13 of our schools uh, that obviously is no small accomplishment i want to thank the community for all their input that they've given and, and, and thank the board for your resolve it's been a really really challenging year on so many fronts um, but we've led and we're going to continue to lead and, and emphasize uh, in-person instruction with a nice uh, robust remote model uh, in terms of finance we're working through our annual bids we're right on track you're going to see some of those later on in the agenda and you'll see it in subsequent uh, meetings i also want to share that Food service is back up in our two middle schools and then uh, of course Henry Puffer and our satellites uh, program that we also have. I also want to let the community know that we will continue to offer free meals to those students who need them over the weekends and things like that. So that's been one of the things we're most proud of this school year and uh, we're going to continue working with that. Uh, I know Katie Hannigan is here somewhere. I think she's been serving as the usher tonight so thank you Katie. Katie uh, really oversees that program and she's done a phenomenal job making sure that those in need uh, don't go hungry during the pandemic. In terms of facilities, just really quick, um, and I, I, I cringe to say this, but I think we are done with the snow. Um, I say that and I cringe because if you remember last year, uh, this year because the cleaning and the transitioning of students, we did outsource a lot of that snow removal. Our custodians still stepped up. I, in particular, or in particular, excuse me, I wanna thank the village of Downers Grove um, we very much view ourselves as partners and they've done a great job really helping us. Uh, if you remember in February we had those giant snow drifts where they would simply help keep plowing them further and further for us and I uh, want to make sure that we thank our partners in the village of Downers Grove. In terms of public relations, uh, I want to congratulate board members Hughes, Harris and Weiner on their re-election to the school board. <laughs> I'd also like to congratulate <laughs> Melissa Bacher Ellis on her election win and becoming the newest member of the Board of Education. There's a great deal of work that needs to be done over the coming months and years and I look forward to working alongside uh, the new board, staff and community members to accomplish these objectives. On a personal note, I get to see it. I know we have former board members in the audience. These are volunteer positions uh, that require 
not only five days a week, but also on the weekends, no matter where you go, people are always asking questions and rightfully so. And uh, it's a big, big commitment, not only for yourselves, uh, but for your family members as well. And I know we have some here in the audience uh, today. So thank you to our families of our board members. It's hard to believe, but it is time to start registering for next school year. So that will come out on Thursday. And uh, depending on how the board votes for O'Keefe, kindergarten will also be part of that registration uh, process. In terms of personnel next month, Dr. Uzentis, after registration, will be presenting our staffing numbers and our uh, final plan for next school year. Technology department has been working very hard to uh, change classrooms around and get everything ready. We're still making tweaks. I wanna um, you know, just reiterate to any families, if your students are coming home expressing concerns because of masks and they can't hear or something like that, we definitely wanna let their teachers know or their building principals so they can work with James to support that. But, uh, James has converted gyms, cafeterias, libraries, uh, all these non-traditional classroom settings and uh, made them work and we haven't missed a beat. So thank you to James and your team. In terms of student services, student services this year has handled a lot of our COVID-19 protocols and I wanna take some time to really talk about one protocol that hasn't changed, but I can tell you I've gotten a lot of questions about this and so have my fellow superintendents in neighboring districts. That is the quarantine requirement. So in simple terms, the CDC and the IDPH have recommended that if children have masks on, they no longer have to be six feet apart, they can be three feet apart. We're still trying to do six feet as much as possible. The reason we're trying to do six feet as much as possible is that it eliminates the need for a close contact if you're six feet apart. Once you're less than six feet apart for more than 15 minutes, even with a mask, you're deemed a close contact. That has not changed. It's been the same deal with our buses all year long where we couldn't achieve six feet. So I have gotten questions from families, why do I have to quarantine if I was three feet apart? You still have to quarantine if you're not six feet apart. That's one of the downsides to coming back. I can tell you, I know it's frustrating as parents. I'm in that same boat as a, as a parent with one of my children and um, we will continue to work through to make sure that our students who are in quarantine situations have their needs met. Again, if you have any questions about that for your particular school, I would encourage families to reach out to their building uh, principal, but we will continue to work with families as that happens. I know that uh, District 99 has had a lot of those cases in the last week. We've had a couple, uh, but that's something that we're gonna continue to work through. As I close the superintendent's report tonight, on behalf of the Board of Education, I'd like to personally thank everyone that is attending the meeting tonight, both in person and online. I recognize that many of you are here due to the potential sale of the Longfellow Center. I, I also recognize that many are in favor of the sale and others oppose such a decision. Please know that none of us take these conversations lightly, especially for those that are in the neighborhood this is adjacent to your homes. We know how much you care, not only about the school district, but also where you live. And I just wanna take some time to thank all of you for being here tonight and recognize that these are tough conversations. We've had several tough conversations this school year. And one of the things that I'm so proud of this community is no matter where you fell in an issue, we've always had really good, positive, respectful and civil conversations. The emails that I've been receiving about Longfellow have continued to follow that same pattern. And so on behalf of the school board, I wanna thank all of you for being here tonight and thank you for sharing your feedback with the Board of Education because we know that this particular topic is near and dear to many of you. So thank you for that. That concludes the superintendent's report. Thank you. Any questions or comments? I just wanna say, uh, coming off of now going into our second week after spring break now being full time, I just wanna thank everybody for the tremendous amount of work. I don't know how many people have tuned into the hashtags on Twitter, our hashtags. It's just, it's been really fun to see all the postings that are going on uh, right now. So it, um, it's really excited to have everybody back. All right, next up we have our monthly business report with uh, Drake Mall. Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> this is one of those meetings that um, is unusual. Uh, there's, there's a lot less curriculum and instruction discussion and a lot more about uh, standard business bids and so forth. Um, it's that time of the year, we're preparing for summer and uh, the bid season is among us. So we have a number of those items uh, for your approval for this evening. Some of those are the capital items that the bonds are used you know, to cover. Others are um, the annual painting and 
and uh, supplies and so forth. So, um, first off, I will I want to talk a little bit about what's in the. Actually, before I even get to this, um, I'll hold off on that. Um, so you have your year-to-date report. Uh, things are moving positively. Uh, we are still in a good position, uh, and and in large part still it's due <coughs> to that first month of not having transportation of the year. Uh, you know that continually be is, is that million dollars that we didn't spend uh, is helping the district get through uh, in this process. Um, as well as some of the other controls and expenditures. Um, so we will, we're in a good position there and, you know, look to have funds on hand to cover what we need to. <clears throat> we also have the property tax extension report. Uh, we received that from the county clerk's office, an update. Uh, this year was a, we had $32.6 million in new property. Half of that was, for the first time, was non-residential. Uh, and please understand, all of downtown development is in a TIF. So all of that commercial property, the district has not had access to and will start having access next year. This has all been um, the Amazon facilities and uh, development throughout, and it's actually kind of all over the area, the district, but uh, $16 million dollars of this is commercial and industrial property coming on for the first time wow. which is helpful as well as 16 million dollars in new homes starting up as well so um, that was good news to have the overall increase in value was 4.5 the increase in aggregate uh, without the new construction is uh, 3.4 and so uh, that's for the 2020 school 2020 levy year uh, you know we will certainly have a year from now, the, this next year, this year that's going on. Uh, you have also uh, in your action items the Rexnard abatement uh, agreement. This is to remind the board and community this is an a, a abatement agreement that the district uh, and District 99 entered into several years ago to abate a portion of our taxes for the new construction of an uh, expansion of the Rexnard Aerospace facility uh, in, off, of uh, off of Ogden, I think, is, is where it's at. Belmont. Um, Belmont, yeah. Belmont. Industrial Park. And uh, so this is the second year of that abatement. Uh, it is down to 80% and it drops 10% a year until it's done. Uh, so that's in there for your approval. And also, uh, is the uh, financial plan, the five-year financial plan, uh, which we can discuss at a later point. Uh, one of the things I want to do before we, uh, you know, th if there's any questions, is the small group that we had out of the FAC for uh, the Longfellow Review. Uh, I'd like to thank, uh, there were three former board members who uh, took time out to sit on it. Uh, Mr. Schmidt, Mr. Uh, Leo, and uh, Mr. Miller. And I want to thank three of them for taking the time to do that. Uh, we spent nine hours, I think, or better, uh, talk, talking and discussing. And I know some of them may not agree with the final recommendation, but I do appreciate their insight and their thoughts. They certainly added to our final report and added um, some insight and some thinking that we you know, went back and looked at uh, and reviewed. So I do appreciate their, their thoughts and their insight. So with that, if there are any questions on the treasurer's report, the monthly report, or anything else we have. Any questions? No. Thank you, Todd. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Todd. Okay. The policy committee did not meet in March, and neither did the legislative committee. The financial advisory committee did meet, but I will keep this really brief because it's all the stuff that you have been hearing. Uh, we did review the, the five-year plan, and we also reviewed the Longfellow presentation that we went over today and kind of the whole process that's been gone through. We looked at the year to date. And the only thing that wasn't mentioned is later on for first reading, there is a policy on there for fund balance to keep our fund balance uh, at 35%. This was something that we had hoped to bring about a year ago. It's coming up net week with, with, the, whole, with the whole COVID response. We weren't sure if it was gonna be possible, but this is obviously gonna be critical for us moving forward to kind of uh, continue to stabilize our finances and we're excited to be able to bring this 
Uh, moving forward, we felt comfortable with the five-year plan that this would be something that we would be able to recommend. I don't know if uh, Member Olchek has any additional things to add? No. Okay. Thanks. Well, any questions, I'd be happy to help. Otherwise, that concludes my report. All right. Uh, the district leadership did not meet, meet, and neither did the Health and Wellness Committee. So we're going to go ahead and move on to our discussion. Tonight, we just have one discussion item, and we just want to take this opportunity to say uh, goodbye to Jill Samante, who's been an absolute pleasure uh, to serve with over these last four years. So thank you. I, you know, your hard work and dedication is appreciated so much, and I know that your family and some of them are here today, have a long history of doing amazing things for this district, and I'm glad you were able to come in and add on to that uh, storied history that exists. Um, it, you know, it's, I, I, can, I know that your, your family is very proud of the work that you've done, and I'm glad that you continued that legacy. And uh, we're going to be sorry to see you go, but thank you for your time here. I know that Dr. Russell has a few comments he'd like to make, and I know that you've prepared a statement today. So, Dr. Russell? So, in the early 90s, or <laughs> actually it was the later 90s, back when I had all black hair, <laughs> I was introduced to a family that would change my life forever. I was a junior in college and I had just been assigned to observe and student teach at O'Neill Middle School in Downers Grove 58. My cooperating teacher was Mr. Richard Samani, who everyone called Sam, and we quickly became lifelong friends. I still affectionately call him my school dad. I also had the privilege of meeting Sam's family, and that's when I was first introduced to Jill. For those of you who are not familiar with the Samani family, please allow me to introduce them to you. The Samanis are proud members of Downers Grove and the District 58 family, and several generations have attended our schools. Sam was a lifelong teacher at O'Neill, and his wife, Barb, Jill's mom, made countless contributions to the community. The Samanis have dedicated their lives to the service of others, and we are grateful for their contributions <coughs> to Downers Grove and especially in District 58. Jill is not only one of the finest board members I have ever worked with, she's an outstanding person with an impeccable character. Jill is a champion for all students. She cares deeply about providing the best education for children in District 58. Jill is a champion for those in need, for those who struggle, for those with a disability, and for those who may not have as much as others. Jill's a champion for equity. Jill's a fighter, and will always do what's best for kids. She learned this from both her parents, who are wonderful role models for all of us. Jill continually pushed me to not only be a better superintendent, but a better person. I will miss Jill's passion and her sense of humor, which she always has great timing, by the way. <laughs> the, district, <laughs> <laughs> the district will miss Jill's creativity and contributions. However, the work that Jill has advocated for and set into place will live on forever in District 58. Jill, on behalf of a grateful community, thank you for all that you have done. On a personal note, thank you for all that you have done for me and my family. Serving as your superintendent has been an honor and a privilege. I look forward to continuing to work with you. And I know that you will not be shy about reaching out to me on those <laughs> issues that you're passionate about. We wish you the very best in hope that you finally have a little extra time to unwind and relax because it's certainly well deserved. Thank you, Jill. Thank you. I do have a short statement, well, semi-short, uh, because I can. And this is the last time I can can, so um, thank you, both of you. Um, I just wanted to take a little time tonight to make a few comments about my last four years here on the District 58 School Board. Um, first off, and I typed it out because they know that I tend to wander as I'm doing right now. So first off, thank you. Thank you to the community who supported and voted me into this position four years ago for their trust and confidence. Thank you to Darren and Greg, whose partnership started with sitting next to Darren at the first candidate forum at O'Neill and then standing with Greg in the very early hours at the Main Street uh, train station and getting our butts ignored. I respect you both very much and have enjoyed setting up a friendship that I know will result in a very near, finally, three 
you know, two board members and a non-board member can uh, go out and uh, have, a, <laughs> have a toast. <laughs> um, to board members past and present, the seven of us make a team. We do not always agree, but we always hear one another, one another out, except for the one night Karat, and I, again, apologize for cutting you off that night. <laughs> and we treat one another with respect. Continue that. Continue keeping students first and know that I am supporting you from the comfort of my couch on Monday nights, Tuesday mornings, Thursday afternoons, Friday afternoons, all the times you have meetings. Best of luck to the newest board member, Melissa. This is an amazing group of people. Enjoy your term. Don't forget to hold true to who you are so you can lay your head on the pillow and sleep at night. Who would have known that after I was the lone nay vote on the one-to-one -one iPad refresh, that two years later we would have a pandemic where every single child and staff member would need an iPad. <laughs> to the most admirable administration team, thank you for your trust and patience with me as I learned the ropes. <clears throat> we asked for things and you always delivered. I think back over the past four years and think, holy moly, what a roller coaster. You guys have been through all of it and have come out stronger than ever. I have no worries about the leadership of this district. To Kevin, thank you for giving us your all. These last 18 months have been nothing but traumatizing at times. I cannot imagine what this trip would have been like without your leadership. Moving forward with you at the helm is the only way to go. To my family, my dad, and my sister for being the teachers and the administrative reminders in my ear. I just have to think, what would dad do? <laughs> WWDD. Uh, my amazing husband who started our marriage with Monday nights to himself and will now have to share the remote. <laughs> and my awesome daughter, Sam. Maybe you'll get extra credit in social studies for coming tonight. <laughs> we'll ask. For whom I hope I made an impression of how to use your voice in a positive way to make change. District 58 is part of the framework of our family. I have such wonderful memories of being a student, working the paint crew in college, and being the child of a beloved teacher, running under the bleachers at the teachers versus eighth grade basketball games, getting to play with a brand new Xerox machine in the AV room that took up over half the room, <laughs> and sliding down the blue-green banisters in the stairwells at O'Neill. <laughs> Most of all, I want to thank our District 58 staff and staff leadership, every single one of you. We send our children to you every day. For my family, that will be 11 years to learn and to grow. I'm, mm, that's kind of funny. I should have had a shot of something before I came here. <laughs> On two very hard days, I sent my daughter to school. The day after my mom died in our home and the day after the new town school shootings. I put every ounce of trust in you to also keep my child safe and loved. Thank you. Thank you especially to Sam's teachers who are still here in the district, Nancy Hildreth, for making her want to run to the preschool door every day. <laughs> To Alicia Maselli for getting us through the hardest year of my life with hugs and patience. Um, to Aaron Meehan and Bob Luciano for supporting Sam as we figured things out and got through the mess to her 504. To Kate Matson for celebrating every inch of her for who she is. And Casey Chick, even though we got gypped for, most, for some of the year, for getting Sam to be ready on her own. Um, as the daughter of a public school teacher, there's nothing better than public school teachers. Craig, don't ever sit underneath a light again. <laughs> <laughs> second, to <laughs> second, to the community and families of District 58, please know that this is about the last four years, not, not specifically to tonight, but primarily for the last year. Please be understanding citizens and partners in your children's education. Know what the school board's job is and what they do. We hire the superintendent and vote on things the administrative team recommends. If we question things, ask for clarification or ask for a complete redo, they backpedal and return with new information. We discuss things, not randomly, but for many months and for many hours of con with, in conversations. When you send an email or show up at a board meeting, angry as all get out, please have done your homework. Attend board meetings, listen to meetings, read the minutes. By the time you speak, we have been discussing and researching for months. When you stand up to speak, be mindful that you are representing yourself and your children. Criticize, 
bring compromise, offer insight, have new ideas, but do not belittle us, do not threaten, do not join the waves of social media. Think of yourselves and your children, but know that we are a school district made up of 13 schools. We make decisions based on what is best for all children. Best for the child living in a million dollar home, best for the child living in an apartment with a grandparent. Think of how to present your challenges, disappointments, and fears in a way that offers solutions for the entire district, not just for one family. We emphasize with that family, but want the best outcome for every child in this district. Third and lastly, I am proud to be someone who wanted a change, went to friends, family, and neighbors for signatures, went to Wheaton to formally register, and ran in an election. I came in second by just 0.62%, of course, to a former beloved District 58 teacher. I've worked endless hours for four years. I think of all of us, I'm probably the least uh, amount of time put in, which is still a ridiculous amount, and will continue to support this administration on vital community projects moving forward. These are the things I am most proud of as a school board member. Um, these are things that we instituted on the board prior to this one, as well as this one. Everything curriculum, supporting and approving the process to get new and updated curriculum into our classrooms and keep it in the forefront. Hiring Kevin as our superintendent, the effect of his leadership is so obvious in seeing how things run, how staff feels, and how the administrative team has grown. Now there is a foundation to build lasting effects in District 58. Supporting the creation and running of the Health and Wellness Committee for our staff to make sure that they are well and healthy. Working so hard to create more trust and an open dialogue with our teachers, support staff, and custodial staff. Setting the vision and goal of making District 58 financially sound at the end of each fiscal year, except for this one, with money and savings to have for that rainy day. The last four years has also included community engagement, strategic planning, implementation, a strategic plan, an overall facility plan, and a referendum plan. I don't think there's any board that uh, Greg, Darren, and I have hit all the biggest major milestones that you could possibly have in a four-year term as a school board member. This last year of the pandemic, uh, in my wildest dreams of being a disaster and emergency manager, I would never have believed this would play out as it has. We have made it through by making very difficult decisions, trusting leadership, supporting our children and staff, and being as transparent as possible while remaining steadfast in our plans. The last thank you I wanted to say was I started this position as did Darren and Greg the same time that Melissa started. <laughs> Melissa Jervis, you are literally the pulse of everything school board and you are to be celebrated every day for all the crap we put you through. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for this amazing experience, for giving my loud voice and deep passion for equity, diversity, and inclusion a platform. And I still look forward to probably another, about another three hours in this meeting. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you for indulging me. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. We have flowers for you, Jill, but thank instead you. of blocking your view, I'll have them to you afterwards. I'm just going <laughs> to, the whole rest <laughs> of the meeting, really, she's just really behind <laughs> Take it No. And I don't, I don't want to have the last word on, on your tenure here, <laughs> Jill. I thought everything you said was amazing, but a couple of things I just had to address because, you know, I always have to do that. Um, <laughs> some things I were thinking about as you were talking, um, one thing that you mentioned, you know, you, you, you lost to Beth by, what was it, 0.62%. <laughs> you beat the third place person by like a thousand <laughs> votes <laughs> because there's a thousand people, at least in this community, who saw how awesome you are, how, how, um, how, how much you care, um, how great you would be as a member. I, I'm so proud to have worked with you. I'm so proud of what we've accomplished. Um, I, rem I still, like you, dearly remember that morning at the, at the train station and how so unsuccessful we were. Um, <laughs> so and how bad. clearly neither one of us is ever going to have a, a long career in politics. Um, but, you know, it was, it was two years later when we were actually interviewing Kevin. When you were, you start over there, I start over there. When we just said one night, we said, you know, to heck with it. We just like sat where we felt like, and you and I sat next to each other. And I was like, man, I, I miss, I miss talking to you. I miss, I miss being able to interact with you. You've been just such a great person to be on this board. We all are, I know everybody on this board and in this room is so appreciative of everything you've done. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed to have known you and, and, and this district without a doubt is, is, is better off for having you serve. Thank you. Thank you.
and good luck. And, and, I'm, and I'm sure your family is very, very happy to have you back. Have you uh, back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're on to public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the audience to share in public comment with the board, but is not intended to be a time for members of the public to engage in a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment tonight may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate. As a reminder, criticism of individuals is not in order. The board has allotted 30 minutes tonight, though I'm probably gonna have to extend that. For public comment, we ask that everyone please keep their comments to a three minute limit to allow everyone an opportunity to speak. We have 13 cards tonight. So the first person we're gonna invite up is Rich Samanti in the attendance area of O'Neill. <laughs> Thank you for this opportunity. I'm, uh, I'm here to address not only the board, but to the community, not just the people who are here, but to the people who are not here. Um, I may go over three minutes, but I warn you that I have a black belt in karate. <laughs> and I'm adept <laughs> at Filipino martial arts in stick and knife fighting. So we came to this, we meaning my wife and I came to this community about 59 years ago, and oddly enough, this was a community that my mother and father, when I was younger, could not buy a home here. The real estate people, and I can still remember standing next to my dad, when the real estate people said, no, we don't have any houses available here. They're not, nothing's on for, for sale. When my wife and I graduated from college, we came here, and in the 60s, as an interracial couple, we had difficulty finding an apartment. I think we had to go through about 10 places before one of the realtors did find a place for us. My wife and I, we joined a a residential group that fought for open housing here in Downers Grove and we won which led to the diversity of this community I was able to get a job here at O'Neill in which hopefully I influenced hundreds maybe thousands of students and one superintendent of schools. <laughs> I was also assistant principal at Herrick and assistant principal at O'Neill. But I missed my students so much that I quit and came back to the classroom. And fortunately enough, I was there when Kevin showed up. To the board, I was one of maybe six or seven people that was asked to speak to a referendum. The board brought in the speech makers for President Ford and they worked with us for over the weekend. Kevin, that's where my... <laughs> Kevin, that's where my... Um, my public speaking unit came from <laughs> and I was sent out into the community along with the other five people to try to speak to this referendum obviously they did not do a good enough job because the referendum did not pass and to the public here 
and to the rest of the community. When Kevin mentioned how hard it is to pass a referendum, Downers Grove is well known for failing referendums. I was on the school board. One of my fellow school board members is here with me tonight. We had a referendum that we tried to push, which also failed. We have a history of failure in Downers Grove for helping our students financially. We need to do something about that. This year, one of my college classmates sent out a, a quotation which has become a mantra from me. She sent me a quote that said, this is not the year to get everything you want. This is the year to appreciate what you have. To the board, to the community, I appreciate your involvement. To the board, I know you have a thankless job. You walk out with targets on your back for those people who hide behind what they call now social media. We didn't have that when I was on the board. I applaud you for the work that you do. I thank you for the work that you do. And I appreciate the work that you do. I wrote a book that I got published a couple years ago that was just a little bit before my wife died, who, by the way, Jill's mother taught at Hillcrest School. I got involved in Kubler Ross's theory of grief. And at the very end of one of her sections, there is the acceptance. I finished a, an essay last week that I entitled Awareness. I took it one step past the acceptance stage. And the title of my essay is Acceptance Leads to Understanding. Understanding Leads to Appreciation. We need to look back in history as well as present and future and appreciate what we have here in Downers Grove. In some countries, those of you who are here tonight, if you were here to criticize the administration, <clears throat> you would leave here and immediately be arrested, never seen again. Thankfully, we don't live in a society like that. But that gives us the responsibility of making sure this society not only continues, but gets better every day. I'm also here, hopefully, it's almost my bedtime, um, <laughs> to put in the public record how much I am so, so blessed and proud of my daughter. Now at my age, she is telling me what to do. <laughs> and so I have to kowtow to her. But her mother and I are so proud of her that all we do is roll our eyes and go, okay, Jill, okay. So Jill, good job, hon. Thanks, Dad. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Next up, we have Terry and Kathy Mahoney from the Pierce Downer neighborhood. Talk about Longfellow. Hi, I'm Terry Mahoney. I did uh, 
go through the memo that was given to the board on the uh, Longfellow issue and unfortunately uh, there's a lot of information in there that I don't believe to be accurate so point number one there were two lease options that were presented both of them assume a fixed annual lease for 20 years I'm vice president and treasurer of a 100 person firm down on LaSalle Street I have an MBA from the University of Chicago in finance and I can tell you I review commercial leases as part of my job. I've never seen a commercial lease without an escalation clause. Uh, a couple other things. Annual operation costs for the two lease options are shown to be zero in this analysis. Commercial leases typically do not cover some of the operations costs like utilities, so that's not valid. Uh, point number two. Uh, the Analysis assumes proceeds of $2.5 million, and you referred to that as conservative. I don't think it's either conservative. I don't think it's realistic either. You're taking 3.2 acres, most of which is permeable right now, and converting it to impermeable. Now, stormwater is the purview of the village, but what's relevant for the board is the assumption in the analysis that you're going to be able to develop 11 or 12 of those lots. Um, the other thing to remember here is, and it's a key point, w there are eight options listed in there. What's not pointed out in there is that this is an irrevocable decision. You can't go back and decide, well, we, 10 years from now, or correction, another board can't go back. Um, that piece of property has been serving the community uh, since it's about 1928. I did go out to the University of Illinois website and I actually found a picture, an aerial picture from August of 1939, a month before World War II started. Uh, and it shows the building sitting there on the property. So there's, when you take this piece of, this asset that's been serving the community for 93 years and sell it off, there's no going back on that. More to the point, probably the biggest point, is your analysis shows you have $250 million in potential needs over the next several years. The proceeds from this property are going to meet about 1%. So you still have to come up with the 99%. I don't think the proceeds from this property are accurate in here. And even if they were accurate, they're not material to the work that's ahead for the district. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I am. No. That's the gap. <laughs> Hi. Good evening. My name is Kathy Mahoney. My husband and I have lived at 4832 Montgomery Avenue for 33 years. I am here tonight to request the board to reinvest in Longfellow School property and not sell it. According to your website, the mission of the District 58 Community Relations Office is to promote understanding among stockholders of stakeholders of the district's initiatives and board decisions. For the Longfellow neighborhood, the Community Relations Office has failed to do its job. I am not aware of any direct outreach to the entire neighborhood. Please hold a special meeting dedicated to, the, to discussing the Longfellow property and give the residents a full opportunity to speak. This meeting may have to be scheduled when COVID restrictions are lessened. It is my belief that the Board of Public Entities must reinvigorate and sustain their district's facilities and programs without tying the hands of future boards to do the same. Selling Longfellow would tie the hands of future boards. For what? A one-time gain of $2.5 million on a $71 million a year budget. This is not fiscally respons fiscal responsibility. The Longfellow property is currently used by administrative and maintenance staff. It is not fiscally responsible to commit the district to use taxpayer dollars on perpetual lease agreements. As stated tonight, the possible $179 million referendum will not cover this replacement cost for these services. One of the reasons stated in the memo of April 8, 2021, which was the only material on the website available for us when we came to this meeting. 
the presentation tonight was excellent and should be put on your website. Um, the market in Downers Grove is always favorable. <laughs> As I said, we've lived here for years. It was favorable when we bought, it was favorable when we remodeled, and it was favorable, um, and it will be continually favorable because of its central location. I'm running out of time, but I'm gonna take more time since others have. The 63,000 of additional tax revenue was based on 11 to 12 homes. If the pattern follows for this neighborhood, each of these homes will have two to three children attending Pierce Downer. According to the 2019-2020 Illinois report card at Pierce Downer, District 58 spends, I was surprised at this, $14,594 per student. Therefore, the additional cost to educate 22 to 36 children is $320,000 to $520,000. Those costs greatly exceed your projected annual revenue increases. Um, projecting revenue increases without corresponding expenses or costs is not fiscally responsible. The sale of Long Pepper, Longfellow property does not demonstrate that the board is acting fiscally responsible. The options table in your memo proves this point. Equally as important, the sale of Longfellow ties the hands of future District 58 boards to make cost-effective education decisions for the children of Dist District 58. Please reinvest in the Longfellow school property and not sell it. And I will just add, I have been a park board member for 18 years. I am fully aware of what goes on with this decision-making processes, and I take this very seriously and I certainly hope you will pay attention to the neighborhood and to concerns about everyone else and this is in no means and no way meant to be a NIMBY issue and I think your decisions will have a big impact on any proposed referendum that you do thank you very much thank you thank you Member Hughes, do you mind if we just, we've had a couple of members take masks off. We can keep masks on for public comment. That's fine, yeah. Uh, Jane Bozick Cross. If you didn't hear that, please leave your mask on during public comment. Thanks, Joe. Again, from the Pierce Downer neighborhood. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm speaking just as a person who, I don't live in the direct neighborhood, I'm in the Pierce Downer area, but not in the Longfellow district. While I recognize that um, the district needs to make a wise economic decision regarding Longfellow, our Downers Grove community places great value on both its history and its green space. The Longfellow building and land, including the extensive green space, is an integral part of Downers Grove history and culture. Um, the essence of, I'm not sure I'm going to be articulate the way that I'm <laughs> saying this, but the essence of a place is often eroded one small piece at a time. We have an opportunity to preserve an important piece of our culture and our history in Downers Grove. Um, so I guess when you're making your uh, kind of the cost benefit analysis, think also about the value, about uh, the value of our history and our culture here in Downers Grove. That's it, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Pam Johnson from Pierce Downer. Hello, thank you for letting me speak. Um, I am a resident of Downers Grove and I do have a child currently in District 58. I believe the district should keep and maintain the Longfellow property rather than selling it and leasing the private office space. I think the solution is the least risky and the most fiscally responsible. The district should complete the comprehensive master facility plan before selling. 
a highly valuable asset that is heavily used today and has many more potential uses for the district in the future. The district should wait for the plan to understand the full impact of the pandemic and requirements around learning and space. We have seen from the pandemic that this district values in-person education re requiring buildings and space. So why are we getting rid of buildings and space now? Um, there is no telling what kind of space requirements we'll need in the future. Also, selling Longfellow would increase our annual operating costs by at a minimum 160K. That's the two, uh, 200K lease versus 32K um, operating expenses. In addition, in year one alone, according to your numbers, there's at least a, a million dollars in increased operating expenses. This is due to the cost of the move. And there was no discussion around the cost of the move. And those figures were not in the presentation that, that I could easily see this evening. And there was talk about building out professional development facilities. I'm wondering if those costs are in those move costs as well. Um, in addition, as Kathy mentioned, um, I do have in my figure the estimated 60K increase from the property tax, but in your numbers, there is no estimate of the increased operating expenses for the additional families, which I would estimate at least 100K per year, additional operating expenses. Yes, there is an upcoming, upcoming capital expenditure needed, but others had said that's only 1% of your total capital budget. And that you want to incur almost 1 million in additional operating expenses to avoid a 2 million capital expenditure that will pay for itself by year seven and many more years after. I think uh, leasing office space is also very risky. You're, you know, you are at the whim of the market and, you know, doing build out on, on property and incurring expenses that you do not own and will not, um, use in perpetuity um also you will be doing a move uh, during the pandemic and focus on administrative staff during the pandemic um when should we be moving our technical infrastructure when our students and teachers are heavily relying upon it i think this board has a fiduciary responsibility to act in the best interests of the district with its funds and assets and I think the numbers demonstrate that the best and true value of Longfellow is to continue using it for its current purpose and maintain it for its limitless future value. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Carol Jean Davis from Pierce Downer. Good evening. I'm Carol Jean Davis and I'm currently against the sale of the Longfellow parcel to a residential developer. I totally get that the parcel no longer serves the school district and my objection is not to um, your releasing of that parcel. It's to selling it to a residential developer. As someone previously stated, the district spends a minimum of $13,000 each year to educate each pupil. How many children attending public school can we expect to occupy 12 new multi-bedroom houses in a good school district? On my street alone, I see new families moving in all the time as the older families move out after their children have flown the roost. Generating $63,000 a year in property taxes does not even begin to cover the cost of public school for the children that will live in those homes. If the property is going to be sold to a developer, perhaps it needs to be sold to a developer that will use it to create educational commercial services appropriate to the area, such as music lessons similar to the Adler Center in Libertyville, private preschool, like a Goddard Center, or tutoring and after-school centers that do ACT and SAT prep, something that is in line with the purpose of the original school that was built on that site. I can think of numerous uses for that parcel, and selling to a residential developer never enters the picture. There are all sorts of educational, recreational, even commercial educational uses that that site can be used for, and if done properly, all of which either generate revenue or they become self-sustaining, and none of them add students to an already strained school system. As populations increase, property and green space become our most valuable asset. 
the Longfellow parcel shouldn't be sold off for a quick fix, especially if that fix strains resources in the future. Somebody is going to make an awful lot of money off this project if it is sold, if it is sold to a private residential developer, and it is not going to be the school district. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <coughs> Marshall Schmidt, uh, DD area, Longfellow. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> for me, this is a, a sad day. When Rich Samanti and I sat on this board, the thing that we took the greatest pride in was that no one really had agendas. And unfortunately, starting with the board, uh, that uh, took, uh, took its seat when Mr. Samanti left the board. Uh, it has been plagued by uh, different agendas and different uh, kind of one-issue uh, topics. And Longfellow has become one of those topics, unfortunately. <coughs> Everyone knows that I circulated a memo uh, to the board this morning, and copies are available if anyone has them. I'm not going to go over that memo because <coughs> there isn't time in three minutes uh, to go over that memo. But I'm going to go over a few things that were said today that um, <coughs> tried to address what was in the memo, but I think failed. Uh, let's start with a strategic plan. <coughs> It, carefully looking at what, at what Dr. Russell said about the strategic plan, what the strategic plan said is that the board should look at what to do with Longfellow and the ASC, but it didn't. By everyone's admission, it did not. It was left out of the master facilities plan. No plan that leaves out two major buildings that serve an important function in the district is a master facilities plan. So the statements that were made tonight that Longfellow was considered as part of that plan just were not true. It may have been mentioned during the discussion, but it was not analyzed. <clears throat> it was said tonight that the working group was created to discuss the um, uh, sale of Longfellow. It was not. That option was not even on the spreadsheets that Mr. Drayfall put up at the beginning. And when <laughs> I pressed him, he said, oh, no, no, this is what this body wasn't created to uh, talk about that at all. That decision has been made. Those were his words. That decision has been made. <clears throat> he said that it wasn't padded, but if you look very carefully in the memo that was distributed in uh, February, it was a $5.3 million number to renovate Longfellow. Today it was a 5.2. Today it was 6.3. Uh, that, that happened since Friday because the memo that went out on Friday was 5.2. Now it's 6.3. The number that was put on the screen is 6.3. No explanation. We pressed Mr. Drayfall for information about the 5.2 number. No information was provided. If so much work was put into this by the Financial Advisory Committee, by the board, by everyone else, Mr. Drayfall should have said, here's the analysis. No such analysis exists. I want to finish. There's a lot more I could say, but I want to finish with this. Dr. Russell talked about renting in perpetuity, and that's what Hinsdale does. Downers Grove is not Hinsdale, and we're proud of it. And if you want to argue to the community that the community should send hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars to private landlords who are making a profit off the school district, we'll become like Hinsdale. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Linda Woodruff from PD on Longville. Is Linda Woodruff here? She left. Thank you. Jason Sparks. Hi, thanks for the opportunity to speak and Jill thanks for your your comments those were incredibly moving um, candidly I'm, I'm a little reluctant to be here and, and give these comments but I felt compelled to because I'm looking at it from a lot of different angles um, I live right down the street on Prince got a, a son at uh, Pierce Downer and a son over at uh, at Herrick and um, and I'm in the real estate business and I'm an engineer and so I know a little bit about real estate and markets. Um, I have been a part of the finance committee as well 
and uh, was a part of the small committee in regards to the Longfellow sale. And, um, you know, as a resident down the street, I walk my dog past there pretty much every day, and it's a great little spot to walk past, and it's, it's, it's a nice green space. Would I love it to be like that forever? I, I, I'd have to say yes, if economics weren't a factor. In being with the committee, though, and being in the, in the small group, I have to say that the analysis done by Kevin and, and Todd was very compelling to me. Um, and in addition to the comments that Dr. Russell has made tonight and summarized, the fact is that it's not a, it's not a facility that we're, we, we need. It's just not. And, and to sink money into this thing year after year after year is just something that I, it just doesn't make sense. Un unfortunately, it's, it's, it, it, it is a sad day. I, I agree with that. It, it's, it's, it's disappointing. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we're, we're here for the kids, right? And we've got to make some tough decisions. I mean, this referendum, I think, I know it's uh, unfortunately, the, you know, failure in Donner's Grove on the referendum has been, been the case, but that doesn't mean we can't, we shouldn't keep trying. We should, we should go for these referendums. We should get, do everything we can to get this passed because our teachers, our administration, uh, they're amazing. It's, it's the reason we all are here, right? It's fantastic, but this, these facilities just aren't. They're not amazing. They're actually far from it. And we need to spend this money. We need to get money. And I think selling Longfellow is the smart thing to do um, as a first step uh, in the process. And um, so I, I applaud, frankly, Kevin and Todd for their analysis. I'm, I'm sure there was probably uh, m a number of more iterations we could have analyzed, but I thought it was very thorough and very compelling. And um, so I I'd have to say I, I agree with the with the case to move forward on, on selling the property. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Len Paoletti from Pierce Downer. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Len Paletti, and me and my wife have lived at 4829 since 1973. And my comments are mostly personal about the selling of the school, and it concerns water. Um, we have the first three houses on our side of Sealy Avenue, 4825, our house 4829 and 4833, were all built without any sump pumps. And we have been fine up until probably about the last 10 years. And all of a sudden, we start taking on seepage. And within the last five years, we're flooding throughout our backyards. You could watch the water run down, and there's no way to control it. And a lot of people don't realize that there was a creek that runs all the way from Ogden Avenue to Warren in between Montgomery and Sealy down at down our backyards and it was all covered up to make development and what I am concerned about is there has been so many trees taken down over the course of time and if they take the school down and build 11 homes you know they tell you don't worry about water they have to provide water retention but you don't know if it's going to work and and for our three houses are, are they going to build or provide sump pumps for our three houses to be put in? Is the village going to pay for that? Or are we just going to be inundated with water? Um, over the, like I say, especially the last five years, all of the neighbors are fighting to try and raise elevation or something to try and stop the flow of water. I mean, our backyard is a swimming pool. And um, that's my concern. It's, it's kind of personal, but... If you tear down the school, it's only going to get worse, and that's that's about it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Samantha Figueroa from Leicester. Talk about long phone.
Hello everyone. Congratulations, Jill and Mr. Samante. You had a wonderful um, speech. It's hard to kind of follow those types of uh, uh, speeches, but having a deja vu, it was about three years ago where I came here and talked about Longfellow. Dr. Russell, you weren't even here yet, um, but several of the board members were. Um, I am here today to show my support for the sale of Longfellow. Um, I'm what I call a joiner. Um, I join the committees, I attend the meetings, I read the materials, I uh, review the minutes, um, and I should let the public know that I have seen all of the details that have been poured over over the last three years and, and beyond. So I recognize that there are a lot of personal issues for the residents that live nearby. And I, I understand that and I sympathize with that. Um, however, I do think that those concerns should be taken up with the district or the develop, potential developers, um, not the district. It's important to voice your concerns. These, these people are, are listening to you and, and taking those consi into consideration. However, um, I believe that this is the most fiscally responsible thing to do. It is time for our community to start investing in our schools and making fiscally responsible decisions. Now, there are people that disagree as to what fiscally responsible is, and that's fair. However, this building does not serve the purpose of this district's needs. From a professional standpoint, um, for their staffing, uh, and also, according to the analysis, even if they redid the property, it still wouldn't meet standards for a school or even an office building for that space. So, for the record, Todd, I've been in meetings uh, and I appreciate all of your thorough detail that's been put into this topic. Um, for board members that have also weighed in, I've heard and seen the detail that you've put into this. I recognize to the community that this is a passionate issue. However, unfortunately, it's time for this district, not for unfortunately, to be proactive instead of reactive. If some of the things happen to this building that could be catastrophic and deem it uninhabitable, and then what? We're at a serious problem. So. Thank you for your consideration for this topic. I'm pro it, and uh, hopefully everything works out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Trey Hawkins, the Pierce Downer neighborhood. Hi, thanks for uh, letting me speak. And, and I just want to say how much I appreciate the board, um, and especially Dr. Russell, I've really appreciated the uh, civil exchange that we've had by email. Um, I just want to start by saying I, I'm opposed to the sale of Longfellow. Um, it doesn't make sense. The cost to operate it is so low, and if you were to not operate it, the cost would be even lower. Um, and it's an irrevocable decision to sell it. Once you sell it, you can't go back. You can't get that land back. And it's a piece of land that's in the middle of a neighborhood, as we've talked about. My neighbor, uh, Jeff Neustadt, walks to work every day. He sees the neighbors. He interacts. There's value to that. Um, I, I sent an email to the board with some specific questions about the financial analysis. Um, I just want to say a, a few key points. First of all, uh, what's being offered in place of Longfellow? We've heard about a lease. Marshall spoke about whether or not we want a long-term lease. Why not figure that out first? Once you've relocated the staff, decided what to do, you could still decide to sell Longfellow. But if you sell Longfellow today, you can't go back. It does decrease your flexibility. Um, second, uh, where is the detailed financial analysis? We saw some slides, as Marshall mentioned, the numbers changed from the previous memo to today. Uh, I have a PhD in engineering and public policy. Part of that is cost-benefit analysis. 
And a few page memo is not what a good cost benefit analysis looks like. Um, we really need those details. Uh, I, I mean, I can take numbers and make them say whatever you would like. Uh, I don't want to accuse of having done that, but we really need to see the details in order to make a good, well-reasoned, rational analysis and decision. Um, a rush sale of Longfellow without long-term planning and robust financial analysis does not support the district's goal of demonstrating fiscal responsibility prior to going to the district with a referendum. Um, it just doesn't. Uh, the rationale for selling Longfellow this year does not hold up to scrutiny. Um, the property won't command a price premium in a rush sale. Uh, these homes won't be sold for years. The value that the developers get isn't going to be the pandemic price. Um, the district will not realize an increase in income from the sale of Longfellow that's already been addressed, but there will be more students, there will be more costs, probably not all the properties will be built. Leasing does not make sense as a long-term strategy for administrative space that the district will always need. Uh, as Marshall mentioned, at least you're going to be paying the landlord for the cost of uncertainty, building upkeep, profit, that all goes into that price. Um, I provided this email, so you have some other points. I don't think the financial analysis is rigorous, and there's some specific points there in the email. Um, finally, one thing that hasn't been mentioned, has the district considered options for appealing its PTEL non-referendum bonding authority? I, I don't know enough about this to really say, but it's being said that that bonding authority is very low. I don't know how it compares to other districts in the uh, county but that should be looked at, and options for increasing that should be considered. Thanks so much for your service. Thanks for listening. Thanks for letting me go over a few seconds. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Richard Demink, uh, Pierce Downer neighborhood. Good evening. Uh, my name is Rich Demink. Uh, my wife and I, uh, my wife Sarah, who's here in the building tonight, uh, live at 4904 Sealy. Uh, we're in the uh, Pierce Downer District and used to be the Longfellow District. Uh, my son uh, actually went to kindergarten in Longfellow back in 1977. Um, I want to start out by thanking the board uh, for your terrific service over the years. I think that the work you, this board has done and the work that the work of the previous boards have done have been fantastic and you've helped this village uh, probably be amongst the top villages in the country right now. I, I really thank you for all the work that you've done. But I'm here to voice my objection <coughs> to the sale of this of Longfellow Center. I think a lot of the folks that have already talked have covered a lot of things I intended to say. I would like to add one point and that would be uh, I would encourage the board uh, to hold another special session where we can have more time. Three minutes is not much time. There's a lot of people that have spoken and would like to speak. Uh, I know there is at least a dozen, uh, half a dozen people that were turned away from this meeting due to the, to the restrictions of COVID. They have not had a chance to be here tonight. I would really strongly suggest that the board have another session devoted to this. It doesn't, you don't have to wait six months to do this. This can be done right away. Also, in connection with the, the planning that was done, in one of the letters that Mr. Uh, your financial person said, he encouraged the uh, long-term plan to be one of the things you consider last. I think that should be, uh, the facilities um, group should, be, should meet again. You can appoint another chairman, and then maybe that would be the time to do it and have this all uh, thrashed out at a longer meeting. And one other thing that was not mentioned was the fact that <clears throat> uh, I look at this as more, perhaps a rush to judgment. I'm a tree guy, so I'm, I'm very proud of that. But when I, after I looked at the issue of the destruction of trees, and I live right down from Longfellow School, Longfellow Center now, uh, it's gonna be a catastrophe uh, of losing all these trees. But the board, you know, we have bigger issues too. We need to move ahead with what's best for our students as well as your staff members. Where are you going to put your staff members if 
you get rid of Longville. Are you going to lease somewhere? I don't think that's going to work very well. Uh, finally, uh, in the rush to judgment, I don't think anybody's mentioned this, but there is an infrastructure bill that's been proposed by the president in which he is offering, and I would like to read just some of the notes I have on it. Um, the, uh, there's going to be $50 billion uh, in grants that are going to be available should this infrastructure bill pass, along with another $50 billion in uh, funding availability. So that, that's coming down the pike. And I think there's, uh, who knows, and it may not pass. There's a 50-50 chance this bill will not pass, so the board has to move ahead anyway. So I would encourage you to call another meeting, have this out when you have more time, and when people have more time to speak. <clears throat> and finally, my wife is the, uh, is the wordsmith of the family, and I would like to close um, with a quote that she has put together and a letter that you should have in your package that was provided to Dr. Russell. And I would like to quote her last paragraph. It would be a tragic mistake and a betrayal of public trust to push forward with the sale of Longfellow Center to a developer at this time. There is not a need for a more high-end residences crammed into this beautiful space. Please do not make a rash decision based only on dollars that the community ultimately may resent. And once this decision is made and the building is torn down and the trees are destroyed, the, uh, that, that won't work. That, you can't go back again. The building will be gone. Let's work together as a community to come up with a mutually acceptable plan. The village council does this all the time. They call together a number of citizen groups and they have regular meetings and uh, they come to decisions and they can make recommendations. I would urge this board to do this to do the same. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> Last card I have is for John Miller at Whittier and Herrick. Again to talk about Longfellow. Hello. Uh, first, I got to take a couple seconds. Jill, thank you. Um, thank you. You make me proud in, that she makes you proud. And my daughter <laughs> makes me half, my daughters and my son make me half as proud as you are. I, I will die a happy man. I, I just, this is the second time I've heard an impassioned uh, speech like that. It's just wonderful to have people like you in the community. And it's thousands and thousands of kids. It's not hundreds. I, your name comes up and I've never even met you in person, and I hear your name come up. You always had a heart for kids, and not just kids. When they, somebody said ADA here, Dr. Russell, you said ADA? Her ears were like a bloodhound. I mean, every, you saw her perk up. Yeah, you always are looking her. for the person or the people that need extra help, and you're constantly reminding this community that not everybody uh, lives in a million dollar house and can afford everything, so thank you. Sorry, I took that there. Um, you know. I, this isn't new. This isn't rushed. None of you were here five years ago. None of you were here eight years ago. Jane, I think you and I are the only person in the room that were here 12 years ago. We've had meetings on this. We've had unsolicited developers come in. Don't tell me 2.5 is low. Eight years ago, we had two developers offer us 3.2 million for it. So I can't imagine the property price of that property went down. There are 12 plotted lots recorded and there's nothing anyone can do about that. They are recorded lots. Back when the village first instituted the um, stormwater utility, that land was assessed. Remember, they didn't exempt nonprofits at first. Jane, you're probably the only person that remembers that too. Uh, they took out government entities since then and nonprofits, but I believe that was equivalent to 11 uh, ERUs, and one ERU is an average home. That house, that building and the parking lots are already putting stormwater to the equivalent of almost 11 or 12 homes anyway. Under the new code, you'll have less stormwater runoff. It's just a matter of fact. And every one of us that lives here and has built a house had a house built on land. I, I don't know what to say. Um, it's in the best interest of the children. Your job up there is to represent the 50,000 residents of the district. The residents of this district is greater than the population of Downers Grove, and we cannot provide public parks or public private space for one community, and not Oak Brook, and not Westmont, 
not the unincorporated areas. You're not the park district. The park district can do that, can, it represents their citizens. Um, I hate to see open space go to. I'm, I'm, I'm just like the gentleman over here. Sorry, I forgot your name. But anyway, I hate to see trees go. I, I do. I do understand them. You know, I lost a big tree this past year. They're living creatures. They will die. Um, if you have stormwater issues, I ask people to take that up with the village. Um, and the, this is part of the master's facilities plan. It always has been. The right study done 10 years ago had this in it. It was pulled from the education portion of that master's facility plan, but it's still part of a master's facility plan. And it, you know, I, I just don't see why we think this is being rushed. I, I just don't get it. We, we've talked about this over and over again. I was one, a board member, that voted to put that 10-year roof on because I said, hey, community thought we were being rushed. I said the community at that point, I remember saying the community has 10 years to figure out what to do and the district has 10 years to figure out what to do with this, this property. That 10 years will be up in a year. So, um, and that, and I, I know, I, I, I feel for you all that live like places. I, I lived in another spot in Downers Grove and there was a development that went on across the street and I moved. I, it was heartbreaking. Um, but I, I, they're, they're, like I said, there are 5,000 students and 50,000 other residents, and, and it has to be done in the best interest of the students. Um, and, and I just hope the board knows that. Uh, one final point. You guys did, nobody signed up for this last year. And none of us did, right? But wow, um, what a great job. I always say, uh, you know, God puts us in places and puts the right people in the right place. Dr. Russell, um, I personally have prayed for you and your leadership, and I think you were put in this place for this reason. So I know that's a religion in a public setting, but <laughs> a little freedom of speech here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, much John. Thanks, John. All right, that's it for our cards. Um, at this time, we'll go ahead and play any public comments that have been submitted remotely. How many do we have, James? There are uh, ten, 10 comments. All right, let's go. Hi, this is Kathy Olson from 5138 Lee Avenue, and I am opposed to the selling of the land, or I'm opposed for them selling it to the developer. I think we should keep the trees and keep the nature and keep the open space. This is what makes Downers Grove a wonderful place to live, and there are uh, new uh, housing developments absolutely everywhere, but not anywhere else. And we just can just come up with um, our name is Downers Grove. So I think we need to have various growth in Downers Grove so uh, the old oak trees. So that's the blow I think it would be great if we could avoid selling this and maybe, um, maybe the park district could have it, or uh, if we could allow somebody else uh, that would want to preserve the oak, or maybe have it be a special place for um, seniors to come and visit, or, or to use the building. I'm not sure, um, but I really don't want that it to be developed into 12 uh, big houses. So anyway, thanks very much for listening. Bye-bye. Hello, my name is Kathleen Nigel. I live near Whittier School at 5253 Blodgett. I just wanted to say we call our hometown Downers Grove, yet every opportunity that comes along, the trees lose. They never get to win. They're always taken down. This is the only grove left in the downtown area. Can we reach a compromise? Six houses and the other half dedicated to a new park for everyone in the community to enjoy. Twelve min houses is overdevelopment of the area. Would be uh, better for the neighborhood. It would be better for water issues if we did half as many houses and then saved the other trees. Developers will tell you anything and everything in order to make their money. Please listen to the residents. We're the people that are going to be here looking at this for many years. And what a joy to have it be there. Please listen to the residents, not the developers. Goodbye. 
This is Chris Hanley, attendance is Eric area. I am calling in support of the steps that the board and the administration are taking to perform research on the potential sale of the Longfellow site. I believe this is in the district's best interest, both in terms of providing uh, educational facilities for the future of the district and also fiscally responsible. Uh, this is what you do when you have an asset has outlived its life and can be uh, placed in different value um, on the open market. So I'm supportive of this decision and also remind people that there has been plenty of opportunity to get involved in the facility planning process that was interrupted uh, in early 2020 by the COVID crisis. Um, thank you. Irene Holkstrom in Hillcrest. My husband and I have paid taxes into District 58 for several years without sending any children to the system. And even though this project has been in the works for years, we are very disappointed that the board is wishing to do a quick fix by selling off Longfellow School to develop into residential homes without any stipulations. Clear cutting mature trees and building a new subdivision in an established neighborhood will be an eyesore for several years. While the district has the property, it can help determine its legacy. Why not preserve the Oak Grove with a conservation easement or work with the park district to save this portion or work with the village to create a planned urban development and include tree preservation as part of the sale. The building may no longer be useful to the school district, but it is architecturally interesting and can be converted into lofts. Higher density development can be built on already developed land. There are several ideas to do that can make this a win-win situation. So please set us an, an example to your students by taking the time to responsibly redevelop this property and leave the students a legacy to be proud of. Like I said before, it can be win-win if the board is so inclined. Thank you. My name is Meredith. I go to Pierce Downer Elementary School. I think Longfellow is a great place because there is so much space to do a lot of stuff like ride your bike in the summertime, build snow forts in the wintertime. We also like playing soccer and softball there. It is where I did my first softball hit. There's nowhere near our house that you can do all those fun things. At Pierce Creek Pond, there's no there is no room to kick a ball or hit a softball. It is too small. I think you should just fix up Longfellow and not tear it down. Hi, my name is Roseanne Culligan, uh, District 58, calling in to um, express opposition to the proposed sale of Longfellow Center. Uh, we have been taxpayers in District 58 and 99 for the last 30 years and believe that the district selling of the property um, is not fiscally or environmentally friendly decision. We're able to, um, in close, being in close proximity, we can see that the um, building is currently used as the maintenance offices for the maintenance trucks are parked. Technology and curriculum also have their offices in there. Multiple teacher meetings are held there and training, it just does not seem to make sense to tear a building down and plan to rent facilities elsewhere. This is an asset the district owns. Once you tear it down and sell the land, it cannot be reconfigured for use by the district at all. Do not be short-sighted in your decision to sell Longfellow. Of course the building needs upkeep. Every building you own will always need upkeep. This is a solid, sound brick building. It's not state of the art. It needs interior rework, I'm sure. Any building will always need that. The advancement of technology puts state of the art out, you know, outdated immediately after it's installed. 
Um, and just another final note, those in favor of unloading the Longfellow School and taking it off the district asset list, you are saddled with this huge responsibility. You as the board members are the elected stewards of this land as well. There are more than 40 mature oak and other species that are at least, you know, close to a century old. The loss of those trees to sell to the highest bidder developer is truly a loss to the environment and to the Downers Grove community. If this in fact results in this, this sale results in 12 homes being currently cited as it could be from zoning. The problem is that placing 12 homes on there now with no planning for the stormwater management is to place a huge burden on the current watershed system. There needs to be consideration for retention area to treat the whole space and the whole development. Perhaps, you know, you won't get 12 homes out of it once you install the retention area. So please be conscious of that as well. I hope that the study group that you've referred to is up to this task um, until the, the Downers Grove Building Department and the Stormwater Management get a better handle on all these teardowns in the village. We should not be jeopardizing the current residents with the construction, with more construction and lack of planning for stormwater management. Is it possible that the park district is interested in purchasing the land, a pocket park? would be great, um, similar to when Washington School was demolished, that was um, the result was the Washington Park. So um, I hope I've kept my comments brief enough, but please, please realize that there is many more of that, you can't uh, just jam 12 houses in there and expect that that's the solution. Thank you. Hello, my name is Victoria Jack. Now I have a student uh, third grader at Pierce Downer. I'm also a board member of our PTA. Uh, and I am vehemently opposed to the sale of Longfellow. Uh, I sent an email to all of the board uh, regarding my reasoning behind this. And I just don't think it's a good idea. It's not good for our kids. It's not good for our community and it is not good for the district's financial gain. I think it's uh, being, it's not been taught through properly. Thank you. Hello, this is Karen Adamson. I live at 4927 Montgomery Avenue in Downers Grove. I'm in the Pierce Downer neighborhood and I live just up a block south of Longfellow. I am calling to submit a public comment regarding the potential destruction of the Longfellow building and potential sale of that land to a developer. Um, I am uh, very much opposed to uh, the potential destruction of that building and the sale of that land to a developer for a number of reasons. Number one, uh, the uh, that plan would result in a significant loss of park space and trees, um, a space that is enjoyed by uh, not just my block, but the entire neighborhood. Um, both of my children, who are now teenagers, uh, learned to ride their bikes when they were uh, six years old on that blacktop. Um, so again, that, that would be a significant loss to the, to the entire neighborhood. Uh, number two, we have existing flooding issues on our street, uh, so the, uh, that construction would significantly add to the existing flooding problem um, on, on our street in particular. Number three, the uh, pollution that would be created from that destruction and potentially multiple years of building, both in the form of um, noise pollution, pollution of construction materials, et cetera, is a significant concern for the neighborhood, um, as well as the additional traffic um, and safety concerns on Prairie. And number four, um, that construction will also cause, uh, pose a multi-year danger to the many, many young children um, that live on our street and in the, the surrounding neighborhood. So again, I, I urge the school district to consider um, keeping and maintaining the Longfellow building um, and, and more importantly that open park space. 
for the uh, for the enjoyment of our of our citizens um, and our neighbors, and for the safety of all. If you need to reach me, my number is 630-362-2881. And again, this is Karen Adamson, 4927 Montgomery Avenue in Downers Grove. Thank you for your time. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Steve Ruffalo. Uh, I'm a resident of Downers Grove at 4616 Linscott, which puts me in the Pierce Downer uh, school area, uh, attendance area. Uh, I'm calling today or tonight in reference to the uh, potential possible sale of the Longfellow School property uh, here in Downers Grove. And I was uh, trying to attend the meeting but uh, was turned away because of attendance limits. Uh, I'm calling I'm just to set a little background. Uh, my perspective is one of a longtime resident of the board uh, or of the district. Uh, I've been here since uh, over 30 years now. Uh, during that time, I served as a village forester here for the community and assistant director of public works. I now teach uh, science at uh, Downers Grove North High School. Uh, I'm a national board certified teacher. Uh, so I think my perspective on the opportunities that uh, you have there at that site uh, may take a little different perspective uh, than uh, perhaps you've heard from others. I'm very concerned about the opportunity, the opportunities that would be lost if uh, the sale of the property went through. Um, I think you're missing um, what's right in front of you is a great opportunity for some educational uh, programming uh, in an outdoor sense. We, we, we couldn't be uh, more in need of that, especially in light of what's uh, happened this past uh, year now with the pandemic. Um, you know, we need to get the students uh, both, you know, the best education possible, but that's not just in the classroom. Uh, a lot could be done uh, with this site. Uh, you know the outdoor experiences, for everything from from gardening to uh, natural resource programs. It could be a jewel of your district, uh, rather than uh, you know we we miss that opportunity. And this is a one-time shot. We sell it. We don't have any chance in the future of ever getting it back. So I would hope that uh, you would give some strong consideration to not only not selling the property, but to develop it as a, a natural resource that it is for uh, some outdoor education type programs, it could certainly be uh, serve in that capacity for all the schools uh, within the district uh, and we could visit there for, for, for programming uh, throughout the year. I thank you for your time. Bye now. Hello, uh, my name's Nick Johnson. I'm a resident of uh, the Pierce Downer District and I've lived near Longfellow Center for about 30 years. Uh, so anyone who's lived here that long knows the village of Downers Grove has an enormous problem with managing stormwater. Uh, the EPA is imposing limits on the amount of stormwater we can discharge into that St. Joe Creek uh, that uh, prevents it from flooding into Lyle. And, and one of the ways the village has tried to address that is to uh, seek and purchase tracts of land that can act as a retainage area. Uh, an example was when the old school in Washington and Prairie was demolished and the land was converted into a park with a large retention area. So my question is, is anyone considering that Longfellow, the Longfellow site could be used for that purpose? Uh, if so, I think it would help all of us by remediating the stormwater problem and not making it worse uh, by allowing the property develop, to be developed for residential use. Uh, thank you. Thank you for everybody, both in person making comments tonight and remotely. Is there anyone on the board at this time that requires a recess? Do you want to see if there's any, uh, any public comments then? No, we're over, we're over the, the we're hour. We're over. So. <clears throat> any, uh, you good? Okay. All right, then next up we have the uh, approval of minutes. Are there any suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? If not, is there a motion to approve the minutes from the March 8th, 2021 regular meeting as presented? So moved. All right, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to approve the minutes of the March 8th, 2021 regular meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the March 22nd, 2021 
curriculum workshop as presented. So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, we please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the minutes of the March 22nd, 2021 curriculum workshop as presented. Next up is the approval of the consent agenda. Please note that the personnel report has been revised since it was published on Friday. One instructional assistant position has been removed. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? All right, if not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements consisting of the list of bills and summary as presented in the packet of materials? So moved. <laughs> Second. Thanks. All right, Melissa, will you please call roll? Um, Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. All right, we have a couple of recommendations for action. The first one up tonight is the 2021 through 2022 O'Keep fees. Is there a motion to approve a fee of $2,850 for the 2021 through 2022 optional kindergarten enrichment and enhancement program tuition? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? I have a question. Sure. Um, I'm very happy that we're going to be able to offer O'Keep in the fall. Um, but I did want to ask, um, about there was questions about what being in uh, every building and so on so do we want to take this time to just yeah. explain flush that out for people because I as it's reservation time for people I've had people ask about O'Keep because they need to make arrangements yeah so let me give uh, the audience just a little bit of background regarding O'Keep in general O'Keep stands for optional kindergarten extension uh, enrichment program so it offers our families a full day if they uh, pay tuition for the second half of the, the, the school day. This program um, is a self-funding program, meaning that we hire staff according to who registers for the program. This year, because of the pandemic and the need to socially distance our students uh, at six feet at the beginning of the year before the guidance changes, we were unable to offer O'Key because we wouldn't have been able to fit all the students in the building across the district. With the easing of social distancing requirements, and even if we were back at six feet, we still feel strongly that by using all of the spaces in our schools, we can move forward with the O'Keep program. This year to make kindergarten work, we actually put students from one school, Lester, into Pierce Downer. Um, I know there was a lot of concern about Pierce Downer not being able to have space. There is space at Pierce Downer. We did put an addition on there, and they were actually able to incorporate the Lester students. Bel Air was able to incorporate the Highland students this year, so we want to thank our family for their flexibility. Going into next school year, we are confident, but at this time we can't guarantee that everyone will be in their home school, but it is certainly our goal. Um, we would have classrooms go down to three feet to a greater extent, so we didn't move children from one school to the next. At this time, though, I can't give a guarantee not knowing where the guidance is going to be, that we're going to be able to fully guarantee that every child will be able to attend in their home school. But we do feel comfortable enough based on our measurements of six feet and now three feet that we can make O'Keep happen across our school district. Um, so I want to be very upfront with everyone. We're confident we can do it. But at this time, I can't give a guarantee that every child will be assigned to their home school, although we feel, again, fairly confident that we can make that happen. Um, so that's the plan that's what we uh, believe we can accomplish so we do want to move forward with O'Keep, uh which has been a huge request from our families of uh, incoming kindergartners did i answer all your questions so, well, so registration normally is like right now or mm -hmm. coming like they're they're soliciting trying to get people that aren't even in the district yet yeah. that have their first forms coming through yep. so what like um what when's that going to flush out yeah so if that's possible Do registration yeah, thank you. Registration actually starts on Thursday. Okay. And our principals, along with Megan Hewitt, have already been soliciting those families. And so that really picks up momentum this week. That was, that's why it was so important to get this on the agenda tonight, 
so that we could make sure that when families get their online registration, they have the option to select uh, kindergarten. And so that was extremely important. Okay. The other piece that I want to add on is a question I've received um, about our fee structure. One of the things that we recognize is that not everybody has two or three thousand dollars at their disposal and they can just write a check. So we've often offered a payment plan with O'Keefe, which we strongly support. One of the challenges we had though when the pandemic hit last year is because people who were on the payment plan, they got billed the first of the month. So we were receiving many calls in the district saying, well, I don't want the service anymore. And we had to have some very hard conversations with families that no, once you commit to the service, we hire the staff for the entire year and you still have to continue to pay. So we wanna be careful we don't put ourselves in that position. We wanna be very upfront with families uh, prior to. So what we've done is still offer a payment plan, but taking it off of that monthly cycle. So what people understand is that when you sign up, you're signing up for the whole year, no matter what the circumstances are, um, even if we do have to be virtual, but we'll still work out a payment plan. I can also share with you that when we had our monthly payment plan or when we have a payment plan like the one we've described, we will work with any and all families that are struggling financially. We will also work with any family that may experience a hardship during the year or if they're not able to make a payment. We continually work with families. Todd and Katie in our business office do a tremendous job along with our principals identifying families and, and, and assisting them. So I want to assure everybody that taking it off the monthly payment plan in no way, shape or form will prohibit anyone if they needed assistance moving through the year. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to just comment on that, that part of the reason I appreciate what you said Kevin, about working with families who need that extra assistance. And you know, I think um, obviously we always have the, those families who qualify for tuition assistance and, and free and free lunch and those types of things. But it's in, in a lot of ways, it's, it's those families that are just above that mark. Mm -hmm that you almost worry about more because those are those families that certainly don't have $3,000 in their bank account to be able to write that check. And even going from nine tuition payments to six tuition payments a year is gonna be significant for them. Um, and so I just, I appreciate that the district is willing to work with those families and work with them. I'm coming up with, with you know, potentially creative payment options for people who need that. I think that's very beneficial and something that I would just like to keep on the radar. We hear about this every, every single year that there are a lot of districts in our area that offer full day kindergarten to all their families at no tuition. And wouldn't that be nice to, for our district to get to that point in the near future? I think that's a goal of mine as a board member is to continue that conversation because I think that as countless numbers of studies have shown that early education is the most valuable for our students and that the, the sooner we can provide that free of charge in terms of you know providing that from an equity standpoint to all of our students would be something to strive for. So. I certainly concur with you about not only working with families, but also the importance of full-day kindergarten. Uh, for the community, this is what I did my dissertation on. Uh, I, this is my, my go-to area. If anybody wants to talk to me for seven hours, I'd love to chat with you, but I'm not gonna bore anybody uh, with that. But I do really think that that is one thing that our district is behind on in terms of offering full day kindergarten. Um, it is a million dollar a year plus program that we would have to annually fund and that's why we're in the situation that we're in. Obviously we've got facility needs and all those other things, but I can assure this board and the community that we have not lost sight of full day kindergarten. It is something that I'm passionate about. It's something that I think our kids deserve and I think not only do kids benefit, not necessarily for the academic exposure, but for the play exposure and the benefits of socialization at that early age, especially with technology and all the things that are going on. And so we certainly wouldn't be advocating for a mini uh, first grade boot camp. We would be actually advocating for more of a play-based structure in kindergarten, which the research strongly supports. So Emily, I appreciate you bringing that up. And that is certainly something that continues to come to the table along with uh, more intervention support uh, for our students. Anybody else? Thank you. All right, Melissa, will you please go roll? Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve a fee of $2,850 for the 2021 through 2022 optional kindergarten enrichment and enhancement program tuition. Next up, we have a resolution for the honorable dismissal of teachers. Pursuant to section 24-12 of the School Code of Illinois 105 ILCS 524-12, be it resolved 
that the Board of Education of Downers Grove Grade School District Number 58, DuPage County, Illinois, that the teachers listed in the resolution found in the agenda item 14B on tonight's agenda in board docs shall be honorably dismissed at the end of the 2020 through 2021 school year because of the decision of the board to decrease the number of teachers employed. Do we have a motion? So moved. All right, any discussion? Just as a reminder, these are the, the additional positions we added to kind of close out the year. Okay, uh, Melissa, we please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. <clears throat> Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to adopt the resolution regarding the honorable dismissal of teachers. We have the Rexnard abatement resolution. Is there a motion to approve the resolution authorizing property tax abatement for the Rexnard facility for the 2020 tax year? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? Perfect. Melissa, will you please go roll? Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the resolution authorizing the property tax abatement for the Rexner facility for the 2020 tax year. We have a five year financial plan. Is there a motion to approve the 2022 through 2026 financial plan, which will be used to develop the 2022 budget? Second. All right. Any discussion? I know this has been a long time coming, so. <laughs> All right. Melissa, will you please go roll? Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the 2022 through 2026 financial plan, which will be used to develop the 2022 budget. We have a contract renewal for first student. Is there a motion to approve the one year contract extension with first student for the 2021 through 2022? Uh, student transportation at the rate of uh, rate increase of 4% as shown in the attached proposed rates. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right, Melissa, will you please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carry to approve the one-year contract extension with first student for the 2021 through 2022 student uh, school year with the student transportation at the rate of 4% is shown in the attached proposed rates. We have a transportation contract for Sunrise Transportation. Is there a motion to approve the contract extension for the 2021 through 2022 school year with Sunrise Transportation for the Special Education Transportation Services? Second. All right, any discussion on this? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the contract extension for the 2021 through 2022 school year with Sunrise Transportation for Special Education Transportation Services. We have an item up for first reading. It's policy number 420, fund balances. Is there a motion to approve the policy 420 fund balances for first reading and place it on the May board agenda for adoption? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? I just had a question on this. I know it's a first reading. We'll, we can talk about it in the next week, in the coming weeks, but it says 35% of, uh, as an expense ratio of a fund balance, mm -hmm. expenses of the previous fiscal year or the upcoming fiscal year? Yeah, Todd, do you want to hop in? The upcoming fiscal year. So as we're projecting forward, so the uh, financial plan that you've just approved, we're looking at what that expense and, and that expense is, is a 35% to the fund balance at the end of the year. Super helpful. I was wondering if the policy were can be updated or reflect that, but we can talk about that in a second reading potential? Yeah, so a absolutely. In fact, that's one of the reasons we wanted to put this out for first reading. I think this is a huge <coughs> step forward for our uh, district, and um, your feedback is, is encouraged, and, and so certainly we can um, add in language and then come back and review it for a second reading. Thanks. Yeah, if you could put that in for clarity that yep. it's the, in the projected year. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, any other questions or discussion? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. 
Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Simanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve policy 420 fund balances for the first reading and place it on the May board agenda for adoption. Next up, we have the appraisal of Longfellow and negotiation of leased administrative office space. Is there a motion to authorize the superintendent and administration to retain the services of an appraiser to determine an estimate of value of the Longfellow property for the board to review in closed session and to work with the district's, uh, district's attorney to prepare the needed documents and establish a timeline for the Board of Education to adopt the required resolution for the sale of Longfellow property and to take the steps necessary to secure leased office space for the administration and the renovation and the renovation of the ASC for warehouse storage and maintenance use. So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? I'll just make a couple of comments just as the lone board member relation with your sorry neighborhood. Um, especially after listening to what so many of the commenters had to say tonight. Um, you know, I've lived in the Pierce Hour neighborhood for six years and I have three kids and you know my kids too ride the bikes on prairie and walk up and down Steely and Montgomery and you know enjoy the beauty of the neighborhood and, and all kinds of things. My father grew up with his six brothers and sisters on the corner of Steely and Chicago and his dad, my grandfather his dad built the house there with his two hands. Like I grew up going to that neighborhood. My father went to kindergarten in Los Palo. I understand um, the kind of passion that the people in the neighborhood have for the historic charm of, of things and all of that kind of stuff. Um, the current house that I live in, the Kirstown neighborhood, moved in a year ago in terms of speaking of the, of the stormwater and flooding. Um, my yard, every time it rains, is a virtual lake with ducks and frogs swimming, and it takes three weeks for it to drain away. I understand. Um, those struggles and those challenges and we're going to be spending a ton of money this summer to fix it. Like I, I understand all that completely. Um, however, having said all that, I also understand the financial constraints that the district is under. And in a perfect, perfect world, I would love to see Longfellow restored to its glory and used for a wonderful purpose and, and all those kinds of things, but unfortunately that's just not a financial reality for the district of this time. And I, I feel like we have to um, think of all the almost 5,000 students that we have to service and the educational needs of all of those students. And we have 1,300 buildings that also have a lot of capital needs and improvements that need to be done. And I wish we could do some of the things that all of those residents suggest to talk about but I just don't feel like at this time that's a financial reality and, and like some people said it's very sad and I won't be sad to see it go I don't like to see all the teardowns in my neighborhood either that that's I, I appreciate the value of, his, of historic buildings and historic homes but unfortunately we don't live in a perfect world and we have to face the realities that the district faces the finances and the capital needs of all of our buildings and, and the, this is the building that doesn't even students don't even realize. So I just feel like, unfortunately, that's the place where we're at. And we have talked about this for a long time. I would like to piggyback on what you said, Emily. Um, I've been on the board for two years, um, and I followed the district pretty closely for the last five years, I want to say. And this is not a new topic. I've sat out there, even when John Miller was sitting here. <laughs> and this was, a, this was a topic that has come up, it feels like Groundhog's Day. Um, and I've learned over, if I've learned anything over the last two years, is that as a board member, I can't just worry about a couple people, that I have to worry about 4,917 students. And this past year with COVID and teacher changes and in-person, hybrid, remote, all these things, again, I can guarantee that 100% of the time that I that I will make a decision or vote on something that will make 50% of the people upset. And I feel very strongly that this has been vetted ad nauseum for the at least five years that I've been sitting here. And I really appreciate all the people that came out and spoke and are very passionate about it. I would submit that um, from Longfellow, Prince Pond is 0.4 miles away. Hooper's Hollow is 0.7 miles away. And Lloyd Park, which is by where I live, is 0.9 miles away. So there's definitely 
places for kids to go skateboard, ride bikes, swing, so on and so forth, um, that I want to make sure that money is spent towards our children and keeping art, music, gym, things that they need that is in, in having our buildings that are currently the 11 elementary and two middle schools that are falling apart where my son goes to Herrick and there's a water lip, water pipe that burst or a, a boiler that burst in another school that would actually impact my children being able to go to school the next day. That is more important than a building that doesn't have children in it. So that is why I am voting uh, tonight and I am in favor of it. Thank you. Yeah, short and sweet. It's it's not rushed. It, it, it simply isn't. Um, so that, that's all I have to say about this topic. I just wanted to say um, I understand. I have an aunt and uncle. I have two cousins who went to Longfellow School, and I've had this discussion with all four of that family. Um, it's been a privilege for the families. Um, it's a privilege for us to live in Downers Grove and for my parents to have been able to finally get a place to buy here. Um, but that does not equal our job and our duty and responsibility to the entire district. And this decision affects the entire district, not just one eight blocks of area. Um, and I, I'm sorry, but that's my vote. I, I would also like to submit that during the strategic plan process, when I sat in the audience, I went to the community engagement um, seminars that were at Longfellow, the library, and so on. And Longfellow did come up as conversations from people in the community, the stakeholders that were that HYA uh, interviewed or had the, and, and that was a topic that came up in more than one forum that I sat in on and sat in the back row as a as a community member. So um, this is not operating in a vacuum. This is something that whether it was on the curriculum council that I sat on, the superintendent advisory council before Kevin. Um, all the councils that I ever sat on, this has come up continually from stakeholders at these committee meetings. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry. Anybody else? I was just going to um, say that we heard, uh, just to thank the people who came out tonight, both in favor and, and against the sale of Longfellow. We heard from some, some pretty impressive, intelligent arguments. Um, one thing that just strikes me as one of the most important things in my head is we've heard many people who said, like, we should, we should keep this property and reinvest in it. And uh, my, my, I haven't heard any idea as to what we're reinvesting in, what we would be reinvesting in it for. Uh, it's it's curly, currently underutilized. It, it doesn't s fulfill really any real needs. But then my, my larger question is, if we're taking money to reinvest in Longfellow, what are we cutting to, to, um, to, to, to where we find that money? Because it's going to come from kids. And, and that's, we're, 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 we're in financial trouble already. We are on a razor thin budget. We, as Kevin likes to say, we are not living on the high hog. We have run very lean for a very long time. If we're cutting money to put into Longfellow, that hurts kids. Well, <clears throat> uh, my, my wife and I, we moved to uh, Downers Grove and did a lot of research in the area to figure out where we wanted to live. Uh, we ultimately decided to move here four years ago, um, not because of any particular lot of land or a particular park, but because of engagement. Uh, you all came out here, folks left voicemails, because you are engaged in the community. Whether you're pro or against any particular issue, you're here because you're engaged. We serve on this board because we're engaged and we, we want to provide our service in this particular way. Others can find ways to get engaged in other ways. Um, that's, why, that's what makes Downers Grove amazing. Uh, that's why everybody moves here. That's why people continue to feel strongly about the land value and about their schools and about their neighbors. Um, it's never easy to say we're not going to continue to invest in a particular lot of land. Uh, but what I hope continues is your engagement. Uh, this is an important part of this community, and so I just appreciate everybody coming out, making their voices heard, giving us calls, giving us emails. Uh, I hope that this only encourages you to be more involved, uh, because it's really important to the community that that energy continues. Uh, and so just appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, and thank to everybody who put this uh, together for us. It's been a lot of hard work uh, over a lot of years, so I appreciate that. And you're absolutely right. The engagement has been incredible from the people that have been involved in the strategic plan. Uh, from the moment I got on the board, 
the strategic plan was getting kicked off and it was really amazing to have so many people uh, engaged and be part of that. The people that volunteered to be part of that citizen task force, the several subcommittees that we've had in the FAC, all of that stuff uh, is all people from the community that have come forward and so we greatly appreciate that. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samati. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to authorize the superintendent and administration to retain the services of an appraiser to determine an estimate of value of the Longfellow property for the board to review in closed session and to work with the district's attorney to prepare the needed documents and establish a timeline for the Board of Education to adopt the required resolution for the sale of the Longfellow property and to take the steps necessary to secure leased office space for the administration and the renovation of the ASC for warehouse storage and maintenance use. Next up, we have a managed internet service contract with AT&T. Is there a motion to approve a 24-month managed internet service contract with AT&T reimbursable via E-rate at 40%? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Uh, motion carried to approve a 24-month managed internet co service contract with AT&T reimbursable via E-rate at 40%. We have a bid for Kingsley Technology Modifications and Server Relocation. Is there a motion to award the Kingsley Technology Modifications and Server Relocation to Oak Brook Mechanical Inc. of Elmhurst, Illinois for $118,340? Second. All right, any discussion? Okay. Melissa, please go roll. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samantha. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to award <coughs> the Kingsley Technology Modifications and Server Relocation to Oak Brook Mechanical Inc. of Elmhurst, Illinois for $118,340. Uh, we have a couple bids tonight. The first one is for miscellaneous painting at various schools. Is there a motion to award the base and alternate bids for miscellaneous painting at various schools to White or to Wright and Sons for a total cost of $23,800? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please go roll. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to award the base and alternate bids for miscellaneous painting at various schools to Wright and Sons for a total cost of $23,800. We have a bid for Fairmount HVAC equipment upgrades. Is there a motion to award the Fairmount 2021 HVAC upgrades to Quality Mechanical Inc. located in Harvey, Illinois in the amount of $364,940? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Uh, maybe Kevin or somebody on your team can provide just an understanding for what this work is. Yeah, Kevin Bardo. Thank you. Uh, Karat, your question again was just what uh, yeah. type of work the equipment entails. That's right. So it's uh, the two rooftop units um, that serve the uh, library and the um, teacher's lounge. It's also the, the four classrooms to the north have unit ventilators from the 1962, I believe. And most of those have a 30-year life cycle. So we've definitely uh, hit that number. Um, also, the... Uh, conference room there's an air handler in there that will be replaced with a smaller fan coil unit so all these pieces of equipment um, I think I referenced in the memo but pardon me if I didn't but have all outlived the ASHRAE uh, guideline for equipment um, I think my discussion previously was you know uh, for instance other districts are replacing their unit ventilators from the early 1990s and we're replacing ours from 1962 also, the significant portion is controls. So anytime you do an HVAC project, uh, there's always new controls that go with that, um, digital controls. And so that's always a, a component of the mechanical contractor's bids. Thanks. Appreciate it. Any other questions or comments? No, no thank you for that. Thank you, Kevin. Melissa, please call roll. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. <coughs> Aye. Member Harris. Aye. 
Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to award the Fairmount 2021 HVAC upgrades to Quality Mechanical Inc. located in Harvey, Illinois, in the amount of $364,940. Our last bid tonight is for the 2021 pavement improvements. Is there a motion to award the 2021 pavement improvements to Schrader Asphalt Services in Marengo, Illinois, in the amount of $158,833.75? Second. All right, any discussion? Okay. Uh, Melissa, please call roll. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to award the 2021 payment improvements to Schrader Asphalt Services in Marengo, Illinois, in the amount of $158,833.75. Uh, one announcement tonight, the next uh, meeting that we have on the books is for Monday, May 3rd at 6 p.m. That will be our board reorganization meeting, our special meeting and uh, a special meeting and a tentative budget workshop. Um, and that will take place at O'Neill Middle School. Now the board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to move to closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the district? It's 5 ILCS 122C1. Collective negotiating matters between the public body and its employees or the representatives or the deliberations concerning salary schedules for one or more classes of employees. That's 5 ILCS 122C2. The placement of individual students in special education programs and other matters related to individual students. 5 ILCS 122C10. The litigation when the public body finds that an action is probable or imminent, in which case the basis of the findings shall be recorded and entered into the mix. The minutes of the closed meeting, that's 5 ILCS 122 C11. And lastly, discussion of minutes of meetings lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act, whether for the purposes of approval by the body of the minutes or the semi-annual review of minutes is mandated by section 2.06. That's 5 ILCS 122 C21. Is there a motion? So okay. motion. Second. All right, any discussion? <clears throat> All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. <laughs> Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The board will now move into closed session after a short recess. Let's meet up at 1032. All right. The board is now returned to open session here at 1211 p.m. Or I'm sorry, 11, 1211 a.m. on now Tuesday, April the 13th. 2021. We have some actions as a result of closed session. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from the Mar March 8th, 2021 closed session meeting and keep them permanently closed due to the confidential nature of the contents? So moved. Second. Any, uh, oh, no, we don't have any discussion. All right. Uh, no, member Dr. Samani. Dr. Rosemary, please go roll. Aye. And then, uh, okay. Uh, member Samani, aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member uh, Doshi? Aye. Member Hannes? Aye. Member Harris? Aye. Member Olchek? Aye. And Member Hughes? Aye. The motion carried. Having on file board approved written minutes from the following closed meetings, is there a motion to approve the destruction of the following verbatim recordings that are at least 24 months old? 9-17-18, uh, 10-22-18, 11-12-18, 12-10-18, 12-18-18, 1-14-19 and 2 19 so moved. Second. Okay. All right. Kevin, will you please go roll? Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchak. Aye. Member Samani. Aye. And Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. Um, and then is there a motion to keep the District 58 and District 69 closed session minutes listed in the attachment? From 4 12 21, permanently closed for reasons of confidentiality. So moved. Second. All right. Kevin, will you please call roll? Mm -hmm. Okay. Member Doshi? Aye. Member Hannes? Aye. Member Harris? Aye. Member Olchek? Aye. Member Samani? Aye. Member Weiner? Aye. And Member Hughes? Aye. The motion carried. All right. I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All right. Kevin, will you please call roll? Okay, we have, so I had, just want to check, Member Harris, and then, who was the second on that? Samanti. Member Samanti, okay. Uh, Member Hannes? Aye. 
Member Harris? Aye. Member Olchek? Aye. Member Samani? Aye. Member Weiner? Aye. Member Doshi? Aye. And Member Hughes? Aye. The motion carried. The meeting is now adjourned at 12.13 a.m. on Tuesday, April the 13th, 2021.